Hello everyone and welcome to Django level 4. We've learned a lot so far and yet there is still so much more that Django can offer you with its pre-built-in tools. And in Django level 4 we're going to be focusing on learning a lot more about templates and template tagging. So far we've only used templates as a way of injecting simple pieces into our HTML files and maybe doing simple operations like a for loop through stuff in our database or in our models and bringing it into the HTML. But templates are actually capable of a lot more than that. For example, so far we've been manually creating everything individually for each HTML file of our web application or web page. However, we can actually use templates to have a base template and inherit that template in the HTML files. This saves you a lot of time and will help create a unified look and feel across every page of your website. And then templates can also be used to solve issues with relative paths and working with other variables. So for instance, Templates can be used to help solve issues by avoiding hard-coded URL paths, and they can also come with built-in filter capabilities, so you can adjust variables on the actual individual page of a particular view. Okay, let's get started on all these topics about templates by first starting out with relative URLs and how we can use templates to solve those issues. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to Relative URLs with Templates. In this lecture, we'll discuss how to use template tagging to create relative URL calls, and we'll also have a quick side discussion on future releases of Django. Let's get started. As we mentioned so far, when we've had to use an anchor tag with an href, we've usually passed in a hard-coded path to the file, meaning we either pass in the entire file path to actually get to the HTML file, or we write a file path to the actual view. In general, this is poor practice if we want our Django project to work on any system and be scalable. We want to really focus on relative file paths, not hard-coded ones. In this lecture and the next one, we will show you how to use various methods to pass relative URLs with template tags. And at the end, we're going to show you the preferred method that will be the main method used when future versions of Django are released. Let's talk about, for a second, a quick side note on Django and future releases, since we are going to be focusing that on the end of this lecture. Django in general has a really good roadmap for future releases, and every two years they release what is known as an LTS or long-term support version of Django, with support guaranteed of at least three years. Now for a lot of people who work at enterprise companies, long-term support usually means something like 10 years, not just three years, but please keep in mind that Django is an open source project, it's really just a bunch of volunteers uh, donating their time, so three years is a pretty long-term support for such an open source project. But definitely check out the release notes and documentation on roadmaps for Django to get a better idea and a better understanding of what the future of Django really looks like. And as a quick note, usually new releases involve better features and easier methods. They're not huge paradigm shifts in the way you actually work with Django and the views, the models, the templates, etc. So think of it more as improvements in regards to what you can expect in future releases of Django. Don't be nervous or worried that all the knowledge you're learning right now is suddenly going to vanish with the next release. It really usually doesn't work that way. Okay, so back to the topic at hand. How can we replace a hard-coded URL path in an href with a URL template instead? Let's see a few examples. All right, so we can easily fix that problem with the use of URLs in our templates. So for example, usually you may have something that looks like that first darker uh, example where you have href basic app slash thank you and then thanks. So that's just the anchor tag itself. If you want to use template tags, you can change that to look like this. You have the template tag with the percent signs, you have the keyword URL inside of that, and then in usually single quotes, you have the actual name, where you have name is equal to thank you in the urls.py file of your application. That's one way to do this. You could also just directly reference the view itself. So for example, in the previous method, we were referencing the name in the urls.py file, but you could also do this. If you have an href and an anchor tag, like basic app slash thank you, you could just change that to be in a URL template tag in single quotes that says basic app.views.thank you. And that will go to the basic app, find the view for thank you, and then return that link so that when you click on thanks or whatever that text in the anchor tag happens to be on your web page, it will take you to that view. However, this method is actually eventually going to go away with Django 2.0 in the future. At this point in time, at the recording of this lecture, we're right now the latest release is Django 1.10. The next one is going to be 1.11. And after that, we should see Django 2.0 uh, further along. That's about 
one and a half to two years away from being released at this point in time, but let's focus on how we can actually future-proof our method since that method's gonna work right now, and in fact, I believe it's the better and simpler method to understand. So the suggested and most future-proof method is to do all of this with the urls.py file. So inside the urls.py file, you add in the variable app underscore name. You then set this variable equal to a string that is the same name as your application name. And so this is currently the best way to use URL templates. This most future-proof example, and I believe the simplest example of the way to use this, looks like this. You're going to be changing something that looks like href equal to basic app slash thank you to change to look like this. Your URL template tagging, and then in quotes, the name of your application, colon, and then the name of that view. And remember that this method requires the app name variable to be created inside the urls.py file. Now, one quick note. So far, we've really only been working with a single application Django project. And so you might be thinking, what's the whole point of all this URL template tagging since it's quite obvious to me what view matches with what application. I only have one application. It should be simple enough and I don't have to worry about the relative URL.py files. Well, later on, especially with the clone projects, we're going to be build, building out multi-application Django projects. So a single project with multiple applications and have things separated as applications. And with this sort of methodology, the URL template tagging becomes really important and really helps you have a clear understanding and clear pathways to your relative URL links. So keep in mind, everything we're talking about here is kind of overkill for a single application project, but in the real world, we're gonna have multi-application projects. So that's where this really comes in handy. All right, so again, using templates for relative URLs, big help for multi-applications. Let's work through a basic example in the next lecture. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome to the URLs with Templates Code Examples lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be coding through everything we just discussed in the previous lecture. As a quick note, the project for this lecture and the project for the entire section can be found under the Django Level 4 folder in your notes, and it's called Template Project. All right, let's get started. I'm going to start the project entirely from scratch in Atom Text Editor. I think it's always great practice to get through the workflow of starting up your project, setting up your settings.py file, etc. You can skip ahead if you don't want to go through that process, if you just want to meet me at where you would start at the template project. Okay, let's hop over to Atom Editor and get started. All right, so I have a folder called Django Level 4 that is totally empty right now. What I'm going to do is after setting up my virtual environment, um, that's optional, of course. I'm going to cd into it. So we'll say cd into Django level 4. And then I'm going to say Django-admin start project. And then we'll call this project learning underscore templates, since that's going to be what we're doing in this section of the course, learning templates. So I'll hit, I'll hit enter, make sure that all sets up automatically. And then after that, we'll also set up our basic application. This will just be a one application project. Okay, so I can see here I have learning underscore templates ready to go. So then again, what I'm going to do is say CD into the learning templates. And then I'm going to say Django dash admin start app. And we'll just call this basic underscore app. Hit enter and that creates our application. Perfect, we have basic app and learning templates. And inside of this, I'm also going to create a new folder called templates and then inside of that let's create an actual another folder that matches the name with our application in this case it's basic app perfect now let's go to settings.py and make sure that our settings is aware of our templates directory and the fact that we have a basic application here so as always we come here and set up template underscore dir equal to os.path.join and then I join my base directory with templates. And hopefully this starts to feel really natural to you. You don't have to keep looking this up. I know when I was first starting out, I constantly had to look up this exact line of code, but as you get used to starting the project over and over again, this becomes really natural to you. Again, installed apps, we wanna make sure our application is in there. So we say basic app, save that. And then coming down to our actual templates, let's add in our templates directory. And then what we're going to do is say template dir, save that. And that should be all we need to do for now. Um, you can always mess around with this other stuff later. Okay, so let's come back to basic app. And what we're going to be discussing here is how to use those relative URLs. 
In order to actually show all that though, we need a couple of HTML files that we're actually going to be linking to. So under templates, under basic app, let's create a couple of files. We'll say create base.html, and we're actually not gonna do anything with this file for now. We'll do that in a subsequent lecture, but we'll keep it in for now. We'll also create a new file called index.html. That'll be our home page. And then again, under basic app, we'll create another file and we'll call this other.html. And this will just be a quote unquote other page to link to using the relative URLs. And then finally, let's create a page that's actually going to have all our information about relative URL templates. So you can call this file whatever you want. I'm gonna give it a really obvious name so I understand what it's about. I'll call it relative underscore URL underscore templates.html. A really long, ugly name, but that way there's no mistake of what's going on in this HTML file. Okay, so I'm gonna work with everything right now but base HTML. You can feel free to close base HTML. We'll talk about this file again when we talk about template inheritance. And then we need to, we can close our settings.py file, don't need the welcome guide. So relative URL templates, save that. Other, let's put in some HTML code, save that. And then index HTML, save that. Okay, so in all of this, let's add a heading in. That way, once we actually visit the page with Django, we know what's going on. So we'll say, welcome to index, save that. In other, I'm going to make a heading one that says, welcome to other. And then relative URL templates, we'll say h1, welcome to relative URL templates. And this is where we're actually going to be messing around with those template tags that we just learned about in the previous lecture. To actually show all these pages though, we need to set up the views. So let's come to our basic app, come to views.py and set that all up. So again, all we're going to be using is the render function. These are gonna be really simple views. We're not creating any forms or any models. So we're just essentially gonna be returning the actual pages. We'll say def index, take in that request, and then I'm going to return render, pass in that actual request for the page, and then just the path to it under templates. So under templates, all of these are under the basic app folder. And then for the index page, it's just index.html. And we're gonna do a really similar thing for the other one. So for the other page, again, this is kind of a general name. So maybe when you're creating your own web applications, don't create such a general render, or excuse me, such a general other page kind of probably a bad name for it. And then we'll say basic app slash other.html. And then the other view, we'll just call it relative. And this is going to be the page that has those examples of how to actually create relative paths. So we'll say return, render, pass in the request, and then pass in, in this case, basic app slash, and that kind of ugly name. It was relative URL templates dot whoops temp blitz dot html okay save that and now we have our views ready to go now we need to set up our urls to actually point to these views and this is where we have to make sure we set up the urls correctly to actually use the template tagging correctly so let's start off with the url for the project itself so coming to learning underscore templates remember that's the name of our project we'll come to the urls.py file scroll all the way down and here we can see the link to the admin page. Let's create the links to the other pages. So that means we need to import the views from our application. So we'll say from our basic app, import views. And then what I'm going to do here is set up the actual import. So we'll call URL. And then I need to use regular expressions here. We'll say URL, caret, dollar sign, and I'm just gonna pass in for the index page, views.index, and then give it the name index. So remember, that's one way we could do this. Um, if you want kind of a subdirectory, so for instance, that URL configuration, we can do something like this. URL, regular expression, caret, and let's say anything that starts with basic app slash and then we'll call include. 
and we'll say basic app dot URLs. All right, save that. So again, just to reiterate what this is doing with the URL patterns, when we use this function views, that means we're directly calling it from the function. So using this regular expression, if someone just comes to your domain page, that's that 127.00 slash 8000, um, it'll just say, okay, go to views, grab the index, and show it to this person on the home page. Then if someone goes to our web page slash basic app, so again, caret symbol is anything before that slash basic app, and then the name of the actual uh, page or the view, such as basic app slash relative or basic app slash other, basic app slash et cetera. Um, then we tell it, okay, go to the basic app.urls page for the subsequent views to show or the subsequent mapping of the URLs, which means we come over here to our basic app, right click on the basic app folder, create a new file called urls.py. And now we have the urls.py file for our application. And this is where we need to make sure we set stuff up correctly. There's going to be a namespace that we need to set up. So right now, inside your application, you're going to say from django.conf for configuration.urls, import URL. And then we're also going to need to say from, and this is where you have many options. You can just say from dot import views. Um, I just from habit like to say from basic app import views. Um, definitely check the PEP 8 on what your official styling should be, but I like doing this from a teaching perspective just because it's really clear where this views is coming from instead of saying the dot. So again, some of my styling here is really tuned more towards teaching this topic versus what you would actually do for a uh, full-on project. All right, so this is what I was referring to as far as like setting that namespace. Whenever you're going to be using template tagging, so this is for template tagging, what we need to do, just to zoom in here, is set a variable name, a global name called app underscore name. And Django's gonna automatically look for this. And then you need to set this equal to whatever the name of your application is. So app name is equal to basic app as a string. And this is what's going to allow us to use that template tagging to actually tell Django, okay, look under the basic app and then find the URL that matches. And then we have our URL patterns list here. And this is where I can say URL, and we'll use regular expressions again, and we'll say for relative slash, and then we can say dollar sign for anything after relative. We will call views dot relative, and we can give it the name equal to relative. And let's create another view, or excuse me, another URL link for the other view that other.html page. So slash dollar sign here. And we can say views.other name is equal to other. All right, save that. So basically what this is saying is, okay, if you're coming to your project page and you see something that says uh, homepage, domain.com slash basic app slash, then you're gonna come over here, go to basic app URLs and then say, okay, domain name.com slash basic app slash relative gives you the relative view. Domain name.com slash basic app slash other comes and gives you the other view. And later on when we're dealing with clones, we'll talk about how to continue on with regular expressions here to show pages for specific users and all that kind of stuff. But right now, just focusing on templates and the URL templates. Okay, so this should all be set up. Now let's come over here to our relative underscore URL underscore templates.html, and let's show you how to actually implement those templates, the, everything we've been talking about, um, but haven't shown yet. So we'll call an anchor tag here. And the big part of an anchor tag is the href, where you actually are telling it to go to a file. And we've seen before that we usually do something like this, basic app uh, slash other.html, and then we say this links to um, the other page or something like that. But we want to replace this so that it's relative and we don't have this actual pathway here. And that it's relative to the actual application. So Django can find it. So since we're going to be inputting actual essentially tags and code, we use the percent sign here for the template. And then we use the keyword URL. And then inside of this, inside of single quotes, is the name of that application. So we'll say basic app colon and then that name of what you want to show. 
So if we come back to remember urls.py file, I have app name basic app. This basic app is what needs to match over here. That's where this is from. Basic app, it's not from the folder name, it's from this app name right here. And then this other name is what we're gonna look for for the second part of this. So we'll say other. And that's all you need to do for the URL template tagging. And this is the way it's gonna be used in the future for Django 2.0. The other ways will eventually um, go away and this is gonna be the way of the future. And obviously you can see that it's actually pretty simple. The key thing to note here is the naming convention. So you need to set up an app name inside your application's urls.py file. That's the first part of this on the left-hand side of this colon. And on the right-hand side of the colon is the name it looks for. So over here on urls.py, that's the name it's looking for. Okay, so we will save that. And let's see if this all worked to make sure I didn't forget anything. I'm going to say under learning templates, Python, manage.py, and I will say run server. And let's hope this all worked out and we don't have to debug anything. Okay, looks like I'm forgetting something. And I forgot to import include. Okay, so it says here, I include is not defined, so I just come back to urls.py over here, forgot to do this, include. Save that, let's try it again. All right, now it looks like we are getting something running, so let's copy this, bring in the browser, see if it works. So far, so good, it looks like it says welcome to index. Now it's time to really test this out. I'm going to go to basic underscore app slash relative, hit enter, and now it says welcome to the relative URL templates. And remember, we have to use this slash basic app slash relative because that's what we're doing in the project urls.py file. In the project urls.py file, I'm saying right here, if something starts with basic app, go to basic app.urls to get the next piece of it. And then in basic app URLs, I'm saying, okay, if it says basic app slash relative, then bring back that relative view, which is the views.relative, which links to this HTML file. Okay, so let's see if this template tag actually worked for the link. Coming back to the browser, here it is again. So it says here, the other page, let's hit the link. And it says, welcome to other, perfect. And this we can see right here is basic app slash other. And that's what you have to do for URL template tagging. It may have seemed like a complicated process at first, but it's really actually not so bad. All you had to do was set up that app namespace and then set up the name, set up the URL mapping, and you're good to go basically. Now you can easily call the URL template tags. Okay, so we covered the very basics of how to use URL template tagging. Let's show a few more examples for sites or pages that you typically don't have within your own custom application. Things like the index page or things like the admin page. But a quick note before we get started on that, a really common bug or error that will be a head scratcher is if you accidentally leave an extra line here in the string, either before you have this or after you have that. Um, what happens is Django ends up looking for space basic app as a string instead of just basic app as a string or they use the name other blank or a space there. So make sure that these actual quotes end up touching that. Um, that can be a really, tricky error to solve because when it prints it out, it says, oh, I can't find the name other. And then you'll look over here on urls.py and you say, no, I really do have the name other. What's going on here? So definitely be careful with this one. That's a really common error and it happens to me sometimes and it's a big head scratcher. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, let's move along to show you how you could add something like the admin page as a anchor tag. So we'll say href percent sign. And then for this, again, you call URL and in this case, you're going to call admin index. So basically what's going on is if you go to settings.py in your project, you'll notice that not only is your basic app a application, but also django.contrib.admin. And we don't actually have that open, but if you wanted to, you could open up uh, the Django source code or just check out the application admin. That's something that always gets imported as an installed application, but inside of that, in its own urls.py file, there is an admin application with an index named view that it will take you to. Something to note here is that in order for this to work, sometimes you have to make the migration just because admin wants it that way. So we can go ahead and do that. So we can say python manage.py migrate, hit enter, 
it will run all the migrations for everything that's uh, a default application. And then we can actually say Python manage.py, run server, hit enter, and then we can bring in the browser page. And here I have it on welcome to index, but let's take it to uh, basic app slash relative. And now I actually forgot to put some text in there to the anchor tag. So let me do that first. So if you notice, I have my, I have my anchor tag, but I forgot to put text in there. So let's bring that in and let's make this a link to, if I come here, link to admin and we'll save that. See if that gets updated as I refresh the page. Okay, so I just refreshed the page over here. You can see I refreshed it and now it says link to admin. So now if I click link to admin, it takes me to the admin page. So we can expand on that and we see Django administration, username and password. I can hit back. If I hit the other page, it takes me to the other page. Okay, let me show you one more example of how to get to the index page, which is also a little different because it's not in your own application. I'll move this aside, show it to you here. For this, it's actually even simpler. All you have to do is create an anchor tag and the href, again, it's the block, but in this case it's URL and just straight up index. Again, make sure that there's no spaces before or after index in that string. So we can save that and let's say link to index. I'm going to refresh my page and it says, okay, welcome to other, let's go back here, refresh this. And it says the other page, link to admin, link to index, and there's my index page. Okay, so those are three main examples that you're gonna be using, your own application view, you know, the admin index view, and then just the home view. And again, keep in mind with these spaces that could really trip you up. But hopefully you saw how this is a pretty simple process. If you have any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums. I'm always happy to help out, but this is a great way to use relative URL and the power of templates in your Django project. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture on template inheritance. Let's learn how we can use Django template inheritance to practice dry coding principles. Dry standing for don't repeat yourself. Template inheritance allows us to create a base template we can inherit from. Earlier we saw that we created a base.html file but left it blank. In this lecture we're going to explain what we're going to be using it for and in the next lecture we'll actually code out through the example. Template inheritance saves us a lot of repetitive work and it makes it much easier to maintain the same base look and feel across our entire website. For example, if we wanted a navbar at the top of our page, it wouldn't make sense to have to continually have the same navbar HTML code in each individual.html file. Before this lecture, we used to have to have the same navbar HTML code over and over again if we wanted to extend it to every page in our Django project. Granted, we haven't actually done that at all yet, but we would have had to do that given what we know so far. So instead of doing that, we can actually set it to the base.html file and inherit it using template inheritance. This idea is also sometimes known as template extending, as in extending the base.html file to other .html files. The inheritance doesn't need to just be limited to one base.html file, you can extend multiple templates. Before you begin any Django project, it's always a good idea to sketch out the main idea and organization by hand. This will help you realize what can be used for template inheritance and what applications you should create. Planning out your project in this manner will really give you a good idea of what code is going to be constantly reused. So you can put that into your base.html file. Okay, so what are the main steps for inheritance? It's actually pretty simple. First, you find the repetitive parts of your project, things like a nav bar or a picture or a brand that you're gonna see on most of the pages. Then you create a base template of those repetitive parts, such as the navbar. Then you set particular tags in the base template, and we'll show those tags in just a second. Once you've done that, you extend and call those tags anywhere else in those other HTML files that are not the base.html file. So what does this actually look like? Well, on the left-hand side, we have that base.html file. This is the file that's going to have things like links to your JavaScript, your CSS, your bootstrap, a bunch of HTML, things like nav bars, etc. Stuff that you want to inherit onto the other pages. Then inside the body, stuff that you don't want on every single page, you have these two main tags, and that's the block tag with the name of the block, in this case it's the body block, and then you have the end block tag. Then you can have some more footer HTML outside of that. And in that left-hand side, based on HTML file, basically what this is saying is everything outside of that 
is going to be inherited in the other file. So we can see here we have some other HTML file, and we want to make sure that the first line is always doc type HTML. After that, you can call the extends and then actually call the path to your base.html file. And then after that, you call block body underscore block that matches the name in your base.html file. And then you have your HTML that's specific to this other.html file, stuff that wasn't in the base.html. Then once you're done with that, you call end block. So you can see it's kind of the reverse or opposite. On the left hand side, you see everything outside of that is going to be passed in when we extend it to the right hand side. And on the right hand side, everything inside those body blocks is going to be uh, put into the base.html or extended with the base.html. Okay, so let's actually walk through a basic example of this template inheritance. It's actually a really easy and smooth process. And once you start using template inheritance, it's actually going to make it much easier to read HTML files across your web page because you're going to get rid of all this junk repetitive code like the navbar. That will all go to your base.html file. Okay. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Template Inheritance Code Examples Lecture, where we're going to be coding through the topics we just previously discussed for Template Inheritance. Let's hop over to the editor and get started. All right, so here I am using the learning underscore templates project we created in the previous coding lecture for this section of the course. Remember that we created this base.html file. Let's show you how you can create some typical looking base.html code and then use it and extend it to the other HTML files we have in this application, such as this index file, other HTML, and then even the relative URL template. Okay, so in all HTML files, you always want to have this line of code be first and it's doc type HTML. So that always needs to come first in an HTML file. And you can get it easily just by typing HTML and hitting enter, that will always be the first line. No matter what kind of template tags you're using, again, this should always be on line number one. Okay, so let's make sure that we have Bootstrap linked across our entire website. The way to do this easily is instead of having that link in every single .html file, we just put it in the base.html file. I'm going to copy and paste this either you can do it either from the notes or from getbootstrap.com. Okay, so there's the link to Bootstrap. There's my href to it. And again, this href could also be a link to a local file underneath templates. You could have CSS and then link it to Bootstrap locally. It's really up to you whether you want to link it online or link it locally. It's a little faster if you link it locally, especially when you begin to deploy your projects. Plus, you can always uh, make sure that you're not dependent on someone else hosting this. All right, now inside this body, let's create a navigation bar. So we do this by calling nav, and I'm going to pass in the classes. And I don't have these memorized, I'm just copy and pasting these from the notes and also from the bootstrap, bootstrap documentation. So I would not expect you to just uh, knowingly know all the classes like I'm typing them here. So feel free to just copy and paste from the notes or type along with me. But the class for the nav bar that I'm using is navbar space, navbar default and then navbar static top and then I'm going to put this that comes next inside of a container class and then we'll have an unordered list and this is the stuff that's actually inside that navbar so we'll give this unordered list a class of nav space navbar dash nav and then inside this order list, I'm going to have list items. There'll be anchor tags, and they're going to link to different parts of the page. But these are going to have a class of, and this first one is going to be the actual brand page. So navbar dash brand. And pretty much this always takes you back to the home page. So we won't mess around with the H references right now. We'll set up the template inheritance first, and then we'll come back and review how to do template URLs with these href tags. But inside of this anchor tag, I'm just going to say brand, save that. And then let's create another list item, another anchor tag. And this, and let's actually, instead of putting this class in the list item, let's put it inside the anchor tag. So it's a little cleaner. There we go. And then this anchor tag is also going to have a class. And this class is going to be equal to a navbar dash link class. And we'll have this link to the admin page. And let's copy and paste this. 
create one more. And what we're going to do here is have this link to the other page. Remember, we have that other.html file. OK, so that all goes inside this container div, and all of that is going inside this navbar. Perfect. And then since we're using Bootstrap, what would be nice is making sure anything else I put in the body is already inside a container, so I don't need to call that. So what I'm going to do is create a div tag that says container. And again, all this sort of styling and classing, that's really going to be up to you when you're creating your own project, what you think looks good. You test it out on mobile devices, on tablets, see what else looks good, etc. So definitely don't take this as absolutely 100% must do. Really, all of this stuff at a certain point becomes your own personal choice and personal styling, depending on what your website is going to be used for. OK, so right now I have everything that I want to display across every single page. I want every single page on my website to have this nav bar and have its body contained in a container and have the link to Bootstrap, which means I need to set up my actual template tags that will define this. So we'll call this block body underscore block. And then we'll write a comment here. Anything outside of this will be inherit inherited if you extend. Typically you won't have this comment, but I'm just typing it in there so you can get an idea. And then finally we want to end the block. So we use end block for this. And if you install some Django plugins for Atom text editor, a lot of the stuff uh, is syntax highlighted and done automatically for you. Okay. So basically what we're saying here is everything outside of this is going to be inherited when we call extend on it. So let's actually practice that. So I will come to my other.html file, and this is where it gets really cool. Right now, I have a bunch of stuff in this HTML file, but really the only thing that's unique here is the fact that it says welcome to other. So all I need to do is make sure that the doc type HTML code is there. I can delete everything else and then just extend my template. So I will say up here on the second line, extends and then pass in the file path to that template, which is under templates. And then I call basic app slash base dot HTML. And so you note now that I could have various template files as my base template, even across different applications across the templates folder. And I just need to make sure that I call the right one and I extend the right one. That way you're not just limited to the one base dot HTML. Okay. So once we've done the extension there, what I do is call this tag. I call block body block and this matches basically what I had in base.html that's this guy but now instead of everything being outside everything's going to be inside. So this says welcome to other and then let's say this is an example of template inheritance inheritance. And then finally, I'm going to close this off with an end block. And that's it. Now this other.html file is ready to go. Key things to note here is doc type, always line number one. Then I call the extends on wherever base.html file I'm looking for. Then I call block the body block and then whatever content you want there. And then you can end the block. And that's basically it. You can actually see that now the template tags, when they were confusing at first, when we were first starting to learn Django, now they actually look way cleaner and way more readable than all the other HTML junk we had before. And this is really the power behind template inheritance. So let's do this on another page. For example, our home page, which is index.html. So again, need, I can just get rid of all this other HTML code since that's already taken care of for me. I have doc type HTML. I need to extend from my actual base.html file. So I say extends and then in quotes where it is under the templates file, which in this case it's basic app slash base.html. So you can see you actually don't even need to call it base.html. By convention, it usually is called that, but you could have named this whatever you wanted. Then again, I pass in that body block. So here I call block body underscore block. And the indentation is actually not necessary, but it definitely helps with the readability. So I encourage you to try your best to try to keep formatted and readable code. 
and then it says welcome to index and we'll say something like this is index.html page showing. Save that and then since we have that body block let's end the block. So here we'll call end block. Save that and now let's actually run this and see what we get. So we'll say python manage.py run server hit enter, make sure we didn't make any mistakes. Okay, so I'm going to copy this and bring it over my browser. And I can see here, I have this nice looking nav bar and it says, welcome to index. This is index.html page showing, perfect. Now let's check out the other page. So that was basic app slash other, hit enter. And now it says, welcome to other. This is an example of template inheritance. So no, here my website looks really nice and clear. I have this nav bar showing across all the pages. But right now, if I click on these links, nothing's actually happening. Let's use the URL templates that we learned about in the previous lectures of this section to actually map these to different pages. So let's map brand to the home page, admin to the admin page, and then other to the other page. So we'll come back here, and this is what we're going to do. We're gonna come back to base.html, and up here where it said href on the brand admin and other, we'll pass in those template tags, those URL templates. So for the brand page, we'll have the index one, and this should feel just like review because we essentially already did all of this in the relative URL templates file. So we'll say URL here, and then just pass in index as a single string for our home page. Then for href, what I'm going to do is this links to the admin page. So remember I call URL and then admin colon index, and let me make sure I have my quotes in there. So this is all wrapped in single quotes. Remember to be careful with spaces there. And then again, we'll call URL. And in this case, this other page is under my basic app. Remember I had to set that, I had to set that app name variable. And then it's the name other. So let's save this, bring back our browser and refresh. And if I bring it in, now I can click on the things to take me to brand take me to other and I can see as I'm clicking on it, it's taking me and it really has the feel of a real website now where there's a nav bar that's taking me to all the pages across the website and it's calling them using that URL template tagging. And if I click on admin, it's gonna take me to the admin page. Now note that the nav bar goes away here because I didn't actually go into uh, admin's uh, HTML file and edit it. And honestly, you shouldn't really be doing that. We'll talk about customizing the Django admin interface, but as far as like styling of the admin and having a nav bar there, that's really not necessary. And that's not really the purpose of the Django administration view. That's more for dealing with your models, but we'll talk about Django admin customization in a future section. Okay, so that's really all we had to cover. Again, the main thing to note here is you'll have a base.html file, Always have this doc type HTML as the first line in your HTML files, no matter if they're base HTML or they're things that are extending that base HTML. But then you have everything you want to be uh, extended across all your pages outside of these two key tags. And that's the block body block and then the end block. You can also have other blocks such as like a head block or whatever you want to call them. And then the relationship between base.html and the other pages is actually very clear. It's essentially just a reverse with one other line. So on other HTML, you get rid of all that HTML besides the doc type. You extend from whatever base.html file you want to reference. Then you call block, in this case, body block, because we have body block here. And then whatever you want inside of that, end block. And everything outside is going to be extended, just like the base HTML here. Hopefully this is a pretty straightforward application of template inheritance. All right. Thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Templates, Features, and Filters lecture. Before we complete Django Level 4 and our understanding of templates, let's quickly touch upon Django template filters. Imagine that you had some information from your model that you wish to use across various views or pages on your website, but perhaps you wanted to make a slight edit to the information before injecting it, maybe like a string operation or basic arithmetic. For example, maybe on a certain web page you wanted the string to be in all capital letters, but on another web page you just wanted it to be in lowercase. Well, how do you actually deal with that? Luckily, Django provides a ton of easy to implement template filters that allow you to affect the injection before displaying it to the user. And this allows for flexibility from a single source. So you don't have to worry about editing the source on the Python side, you can actually edit it using templates on the website. 
So the general form of a template filter looks like this. Previously, we just had those set of brackets and then the value we wanted to inject. Here, we can say the value we want to inject, have the pipe operator, that straight line, the name of the filter, and then the parameter that the filter takes in. Now, not all filters take in parameters, and we'll see examples of them as we continue on throughout this section. Many of these filters are based off of common built-in Python functions, so you're already going to be familiar with them, their naming operations, and what they can actually do. Okay, let's show you the documentation on them so you can know how to reference all of the various filters. There are a ton of them, so a lot of times you'll just be going to the documentation, seeing which one you need to use, and then copying and pasting from there. Later on, we'll also show you how you can create your own filters. I'm going to jump to the documentation. You can go to this specific link. This is the documentation link for templates for 1.10, this version of Django, or you can just Google search Django plus templates and it'll probably take you to this page. I'm gonna hop over there now. All right, so here we are at the documentation page for Django templates. And this is a really great reference if you ever have any questions on templates. And as I always mention, the Django documentation in general is really good. So the templates page just starts off by talking about uh, different support for template engines. By default, we use the Django template language or DTL. It's more than enough for our use cases, especially if you're just learning Django. As you get more advanced, you could always check out popular alternatives for template engines such as Jinja2. And this tells you how to connect them, how to download them, etc. So a lot of really useful information here. But what we're going to be concerned about is template filters. So if you come over here on the right hand side, there should be a link under syntax to filters. You can click on it and it will show you what filters look like. So as I mentioned, they in general look like this. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here to see the filters. Let me zoom in one more time, scroll back down to the filters, and here they are. Okay, so the filters in general look like this. Remember we have a context dictionary that is actually calling a key value pair, and then we pass in the key here, that's the actual variable or value we're passing in. Then you have the pipe operator, and the name of the filter you want to apply. So in this case, we have Django, where we have a context of Django being the key, and it's attached to the string that's in all lowercase. And then the filter name we're using is called title. And title, if you're familiar with uh, Python string operations, it's also a Python string operation, where it basically capitalizes the first letter in every word in a string. So you can see how it converts this to this right here. And as I mentioned, some filters also take an argument or a parameter. And that would look like something like this. So you would say my date that belongs to some context dictionary, the pipe operator, and then the name of the filter date, colon, and then a string, whatever argument you're actually passing in. In this case, the format of the date you want to display. And there's a reference for all the built-in filters, as well as instructions for writing your own custom filters. Now there are so many built-in filters that we don't have enough time in this course to go through them all. Really what you're going to be doing is clicking on this link and referencing them yourself. But there's also a way to write your own custom filters, which we'll also show you how to do in a future lecture. But that's all we're going to cover for now in this lecture. Coming up next, we're going to talk about um, just some few examples of basic built-in filters, as well as talking about how to create your own custom filters. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Template Filters Coding Example Lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be walking you through the basics of using an actual template filter, and also how you can create your own template filters if you ever feel you have the need to. Django makes all of this really easy, so let's hop right back to the editor and get started. All right, so I'll be working with the learning underscore templates project that we've been working through the entire section of this course. It's really easy. All we're gonna be doing is affecting the index.html page to actually inject the variables and perform the template filters. But in order to do that, we need some sort of context dictionary to actually pass to this index view. So we'll come over to views.py under basic app. And under index, what we're going to do is create a basic context dictionary. So we'll say context dictionary, and we'll have a couple of keys in here. We'll say some text, and this will be hello world. And then we'll also say number, and this will be something like, let's just make it 100. And we're gonna pass that as a context dictionary here. Okay, so save that, and then to make sure it works, on the index page, let's just inject those two variables themselves. So remember, the first one was just called text, and then the second one was just called num numbers or number, let me make sure, number. 
Okay, so we'll save that. And let's actually run our server. So python manage.py run server and call it, make sure to actually there on that index page. So I'm going to copy this, bring over my browser. And bringing in my browser, I can see it right here. Hello world and 100. This is actually quite small, so let's enlarge it, bring that away, and let's put this under an h1 tag. So I'm going to actually say welcome to index, comment that out, and let's make an h1 tag that this will go into. So we'll put the text in an h1 tag, that way we can just clearly see and I don't have to awkwardly zoom in that far. Copy that, paste that in, save this, I'm refreshing my page, and now I see welcome to index, hello world 100. Okay, so what is a typical filter actually look like? Well, the majority of them actually usually don't take uh, parameters or additional arguments. They're usually based off of some sort of Python method that you would call on that basic data type. So if you ever think, oh man, there's a Python method I would like to do on this string, definitely look up the filter reference, at least the built-in ones. It's almost 100% sure to actually be there already implemented for you. So let's do that with hello world, the text. Let's say I wanted to uppercase all the text. Well, you could use dot upper parentheses on a Python string, and it's really no different over here. You just say text, the pipe operator, and then pass in the name of whatever the filter you're using is. And in this case, it's upper. And usually syntax-wise, they're both going to be touching that pipe operator, so you will see it like that without any space. Okay, so let's save that and bring in our page refreshed. So I refresh the page, it's coming in, and now I can see hello world, it's all in uppercase. Now, same with number, it's also a very simple process. Let's show you an example of one that would have an additional argument. For instance, one of the most simple ones is just adding a number. So we can say number, the pipe operator, add is the name of that actual filter, then we say colon, and in a string, you can pass in whatever you want to add. So in this case, let's add, let's add the number, uh, 99 to it just to make it really obvious. So we'll save that, refresh our page and bring it back in. And here if I bring it back in I can see it's 199 after the refresh. Okay. Now let's talk about how you can create your own custom filters. Usually you'll be able to find your own filter, the built-in filters to be more than enough and sometimes you'll even be doing a lot of this logic on the back end and some other Python script. But let's say you really need to do it with a template and you need your own filter. Well, it's absolutely no problem. Django can certainly handle that. So what you need to do is create a function that will work with that filter. In order to set this all up, we have to follow a convention as far as where to actually place our custom template filters. And what you end up doing is inside your application, at the same level of models and views, essentially what you're going to do is underneath that application, you'll create a new folder or a new directory and you will call it template tags. And then inside of this, you're going to make sure to create a new file and you will call it underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot pi. And that file is just going to be totally empty. Basically what this file says is it tells Python to treat this as a module. That way it can call it and load it in. What you're going to be doing usually is creating a new file and then this is where you're going to actually put in your custom templates. So we can say something like uh, my underscore extras dot pi. And now let's show you how you can actually create your own filters. And you can always reference the documentation, just look up Django custom template tags and this would all be in there. So what you end up doing is first, you need to actually register all of this. So you will say from Django import, and it's going to be template. And then you create an object called register, and you set it equal to template dot, and it's a library. And actually this should be capital L. There we go. So it's register equals template dot library. And then what you're going to do is write a function that will be your custom template filter. So we can say def, and let's follow the one that's in the documentation example, such as cut. And this is one that takes in an actual value. So that's whatever the variable or value from your context dictionary you're going to pass, and then any additional argument. So we'll just call that arg. And we'll say what this function does. It's always good to give it a doc string. 
we'll say this cuts out all values of arg from the string. And then what we're going to do is we'll say return and we'll grab that value. We're going to assume it's a string. Again, you're going to have to be careful with your kind of assumptions here. And then we'll say uh, arg and then that. So basically you can call the dot replace method off a of Python string and then pass in what you're looking for and then what you want to replace it with. This is a really common uh, Python string operation. So we're just kind of putting this whole thing and wrapping it into this nice little custom filter called cut. And then what we need to do is register this. So what we do is over here, we can say register dot filter. And I pass in as a string what I actually want to call this filter. So when I call it in my custom filter template tag, we'll just call it cut. And then you have to actually pass in the function itself you just created, which in this case is also cut. So the first one is going to be the string that you call the function when you're using the template tag. The second one is the function itself. So it's not a string, just a direct call to this function. Okay. So that's the very basics, and it's kind of in the order that you're thinking it of. So from Django import template, register, then you create whatever custom template filter, and then here it is. So let's actually try this out now. It's so coming back to our index.html page. Instead of saying text uh, upper, what we're going to do is this. We'll say text, and then we're going to say cut, and then let's cut out the term hello. So I will save this and let's bring back in our project over here. And if I refresh this, nope, it cut off uh, hello. So that was our own custom filter cut and it cuts out anything that was placed as a parameter. And that's the very basics of how you can create your own custom filter. Now as a quick note, there's another way to register the filter itself. So if we come back here under template tags in it and then my extras, we registered using this register equals template.library. That is one way to do it, but you can also do it with decorators and it looks a little cleaner. So remember back when we were uh, introducing decorators in the Python level two section of the course, I mentioned that later on in Django, I would talk about decorators and then uh, advise you to go back. So this is that time. If you haven't learned about decorators yet, now is the time to go to the decorators lecture go through it. It's a little complicated, but it'll make a lot more sense when you actually see it here. So I'm going to comment this out, this register.filter. Since I'm passing in essentially what is a function into another function call, I will do this. We can say at register.filter and then give it the name equal to cut. Save this. And now what we're going to do is to make sure this all worked is come back to index. And instead of cutting hello, I'm going to cut world, save that as well. And then bring in my actual browser, refresh this. And here I see just hello. So world got cut out. And that's how you can use decorators to actually register these custom filters. And this looks kind of a lot nicer and a lot clearer, especially if you already know decorators. All right. So that's it for templates. There's still a lot more you can explore in the documentation, but this should be enough for you to create basically any uh, normal website that you want to work with. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next section of the course. Hello everyone, and welcome to Django Level 5. In this section of the course, we're going to be focusing on user authentication. So far, we've only created applications that assume everyone's going to see the same pages. And this is one of those aspects of Django where there are lots of built-in available tools as well as plenty of external packages that enhance the functionality of user authentication. We're going to be focusing mainly on the built-in tools for this particular section of the course. And we'll be talking about users and the user model, talking about permissions, groups, passwords and authentication, and then how to have users log in and log out of your website. Okay, let's get started. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to the Passwords Lecture for Django Level 5. In this lecture, we will discuss the general setup to begin getting ready for user authentication on our website. And we'll also talk about passwords in general and also discuss some additional library options for extra security. 
The first thing we need to take care of is setting up our ability to authenticate a user. And to do this, we need to use some built-in apps and make sure that they are under the installed apps list in settings.py. So in your settings.py file of your project, remember we have that installed apps variable, which is a list of the applications, and we've added our own applications to that list. But in order to do user authentication, you need to make sure that these two applications are there, django.contrib.authorization, or A-U-T-H, and then django.contrib.content types. And often these are already preloaded in that list for you, so you shouldn't need to add anything, especially for higher levels of Django. Like in this course, we're using Django 1.10 at this time, so those two should already be in there. But if you do need to add them for any reason, make sure to migrate your database to actually add those applications. Okay, the next thing we need to do is make sure we store our passwords safely. And this should go without saying, but again, never store passwords as plain text ever. Never store passwords as plain text ever. Ever. And I said that twice on purpose because you should never do that. Basically, if you're storing the passwords as plain text, uh, not only is it vulnerable if someone hacks your database, but it's also a little unethical in the fact that basically any Django admin could come in and see the passwords. All right. So, what we're going to do is begin by using the default PBKDF2 algorithm, which uses an SHA 256 hash, and that's already built into Django. And this is already quite secure for most applications. It really requires a massive amount of computing power to crack that hash. But if you want more security, you can upgrade to even more secure hashing algorithms. And Django makes it really easy. So as I mentioned, Django makes that process super easy. So we're going to show you how to use the bcrypt library and also the argon2 library, which I believe was the 2015 winner of some sort of open source algorithmic hashing uh, contest. There's more information on the Django website about that. But in order to use these two uh, even more secure hashing algorithms, in your virtual environment, what you're going to do is pip install bcrypt and then pip install Django and then square brackets argon2 inside of that. And depending on your Django version, you may already have these installed. So it may just say something like uh, Django argon2 already found, etc. Okay, so we'll also show you how to do that in case you want a super secure hashing algorithm. And inside of settings.py, what we're going to do is pass in the list of password hashers, and you pass them in in the order you want to try them. So if for some reason you don't have library support, maybe you uploaded your website onto a server that's hosting and you forgot to install bcrypt, well, don't worry, it's not going to give an error, it just will skip bcrypt and then eventually fall back to the original hashing algorithm that's built into Django. And as sometimes users will also try to use a very weak password, such as the word password or password123, you can also add in validator options to prevent a user from doing that. And we'll keep things simple for now and only require a minimum length, but you can add in all sorts of validators, like you must use a combination of numbers, letters, special characters, minimum lengths, etc. Now that we've covered conceptually what the process is for setting up a password of Django, let's actually code through those steps to set up that password system. And then in future lectures, what we're going to do is add to this by setting up user models in our registration forms. I'm going to hop over to the Atom text editor, and I'm also going to show you a website to give you an idea of what the hashing process actually looks like. Let's get to it. All right, before we actually get started with programming in Django, our password application, what I wanted to show you is briefly talk a little bit more about what an SHA hash looks like. So here I am at a website that has this little hash calculator. And if you type in some data here, such as the letter A, you can calculate the hash and it returns back the actual hash that matches up with this particular piece of data. And you'll notice that even if we change it a tiny bit, maybe A dot, I will get pretty much a totally different hash. If you click it again, uh, it to looks totally different. And the idea is there's no discernible pattern here, even if you add in just a little bit of data. SHA, again, it stands for Secure Hash Algorithm, was actually designed by the National Security Agency, or the NSA. And it falls more under mathematics than actual programming. Essentially, what it is, it's a cryptographic hash function that can run on digital data. And the way it works is you pass in your data, it passes through the algorithm, it gets converted to a hash, and then you can use this hash to compare to other input hash data. So what the user is going to do is they will input their password and we will be saving the hash for that. So if someone goes to our database and happens to crack it open and they steal all our data, well, they don't steal the user passwords, they only steal the user hash. And there's even more ways of securing this hash. You can add things like salt to it. 
So there's a lot of things you can do with a hash. For instance, a common practice is if you want to know if a piece of data was tampered with at all, you would have a known hash value of the original data and then an expected hash value there. You could check what you believe to be tampered, run it through the hash algorithm, and if the hashes are any different, then you know someone actually modified or tampered with that data. And again, another key aspect of cryptographic hash functions is collision resistance. We want to make sure that no two pieces of data would come up with the same hash. So that's also a key part of this mathematical function. And all of this falls a lot more under math than computer science in general or programming. It's really heavy on math. Now definitely computer science and math uh, overlap in huge amounts, so don't get me wrong, this definitely is uh, a computer science topic, but the actual way the hash works falls a lot more under mathematics. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out the Wikipedia pages. Uh, they're super interesting topics, but I just wanted to point that out, that when we actually look at our user data using Django Admin, we're gonna see something that looks more like this. And then even more so, uh, as far as security, a lot of this will be censored to the Django Admin interface. It'll just show a bunch of dots there. So if you don't trust the Django Admin, well, they won't be able to get the hash back either. And also the whole point is you can't come from this hash and get back the data, at least not easily. Okay, so let's hop over to the Atom text editor and start working on this. All right, so at Atom, what I'm going to do is start a new folder under Django Lectures, and we'll call it Django Level 5. Hit Enter, and I'm going to open up my terminal here, and then I'm also going to remember to activate my virtual environment. In my case, it was called my... Django ENV, hit enter and activate that virtual environment. Okay, so now that my virtual environment is activated, let's CD into uh, Django level five. And then what I'm going to do is call the Django, Django dash admin tool and say start project. And we'll call this project learning underscore users. Cause that's basically what we're gonna be doing, learning about uh, users and user authentication with Django. And then we'll also start an application, and we can call that application uh, basic app, just like we've been doing for a few of these projects. So let's go to Django dash, actually let's CD into that folder first. CD to learning users, now call it Django dash admin, and say start app, and then we'll call it basic underscore app. Hit enter, and that should start our application. So now if I expand this, I see my learning users, see my basic app, etc. And what I want to do first is go to settings.py. We're actually going to be working with this uh, quite a bit for this particular section of the course, a lot more than normal. But we're going to scroll down here, uh, pass all of this stuff, and then here under installed apps, this is where you want to check that you make sure you have django.contrib.admin already there. You also want to make sure that you have django.contrib.auth for authorization already there, and then django.contrib.content types. If you're using uh, Django 1.10 or above, you should already have these just based off the uh, start project in your installed apps. If for some reason you don't have them, feel free to add the strings in there. And what we also wanna do is add in our basic application. So we'll say basic app and then save it. And again, whenever you add something to installed apps, you wanna make sure that you actually run Python manage.py migrate, hit enter, and that will make sure that those applications are registered to the entire project. And you should see a bunch of stuff like this, and that's applying all those changes. And then we'll also want to say Python manage.py make migrations to your actual application. In this case, it's basic app. So we'll run that. Good if it doesn't detect any changes. And then safe, just say Python manage.py make or migrate. And it should say no migrations to apply. But I always do that just to stay safe. Okay, so those are the installed apps. Make sure you have those there. And as I mentioned, we never want to store passwords as plain text ever, period. So what we're going to be doing is showing you how to actually pass in the different algorithms for hashing. And in order to use some of the more advanced algorithms, we actually need to install those libraries. So these libraries are so popular that Django pretty much supports them almost out of the box. And sometimes they may even already be installed when you install Django, depending on what distribution you're using. But just to make sure we have them, the first one is going to be the bcrypt. So let's say pip install bcrypt. So that's B C R Y P T. Pip install bcrypt. Hit enter, and then that should install bcrypt for you. So I'm going to jump forward in time until that's finished installing. 
Okay, that just finished for me. Overall, for my computer, it took about 30 seconds, so it wasn't that long or probably even less than that, maybe like 10 seconds. And then the next one we want to install is pip install, and we'll say Django, and then in brackets we want to say argon2, close brackets, hit enter, and then it's also going to grab them. And you can see that actually, I believe this one was already installed, so it should say requirements already satisfied. So yeah, so we already had a lot of these uh, requirements satisfied, so you may find that as well, but there we go. Okay, so now we have those two ready to go. Then the next step is inside of settings.py, we can pass in a list of the password hashes we want to try. So anywhere in the settings.py file, although I like to keep everything that has to do with passwords down here, we're going to do some stuff. So I'm going to collapse this directory tree. And there's actually usually a link here to more information about authorization, passwords, and validation. Uh, Django documentation, you heard me say it a million times, it's fantastic. So definitely check out those links. But we're going to create a new variable called password underscore hashers, all caps. And this is where we actually pass in what we want to hash with. And then we'll put in some brackets here. And then this is where you actually pass in a string of what all the password hashing looks like. So the basic ones, the default ones, go like this. They say Django contrib dot A-U-T-H for authorization dot hashers dot and then the name of the actual password hasher algorithm and the built-in ones are uh, pbkdf2 and then password hasher so that's whoops hasher so that's one of them and then the other one is with a higher level of bit and then you can pass in the argon ones as well now this is a lot of strings to be typing so to save some time i'm actually going to just copy and paste all of these from the notes, so I would advise you to do the same. Or you can definitely check this out. If you take the link to the documentation, it actually has all of these as well written out for you as an example already. But basically what's gonna happen is we're going to try with our most powerful hasher first, the argon2 password hasher. If for some reason we don't have that installed on the server, then we'll try with the bcrypt password hasher. If for some reason the SHA-256 bit version of bcrypt doesn't work, maybe we try just the normal bcrypt. If that still doesn't work, then we'll try the built-in, uh, this one. If that still doesn't work, then we'll try this one as well. So you basically have all these layers of password hashing security to fall back on. Okay. So the next part is, is password validator. So if we scroll down here, we already see we have a lot of password validators ready to use for us. So we can say user attribute similarity. And basically what that does is you can't use your username inside your password. So if your username is Jose, you can't use something like Jose's special password as your password. Um, things like common password validators, those are checks for common passwords like one, two, three, uh, pass, the word password, et cetera numeric password validators to make sure it has numbers, minimum length, etc. And you can check the documentation for lists and examples of all the various types of password validators you can manipulate or ask for. If you want a super secure site and you don't really trust your users to make good passwords, uh, definitely use password validators a lot. Um, sometimes if you use too many password validators, they can be really annoying. I'm sure you've been to one of those websites where you have to change your password every six months and it has to have some crazy combination of special characters, numbers, and letters. Uh, that's totally fine if you want a super secure site, but if you want your site to be at least a little user friendly, then don't go overboard on these password validators. It really depends on where you want to balance yourself between uh, user friendliness and security. Okay, so let me show you an example of what this actually looks like. We can see here that we have a list of what are essentially dictionaries, where the name key relates to the actual password validation that you're using. So for example, here we have name, and then the password validation we're using here is minimum length. So what you end up doing is adding another key to this dictionary, and the key is options, and then inside of that, you nest in another dictionary of all the options that are available to you for the minimum length evaluator. And you can look at the documentation for the various options, but one of the most common ones, minimum length, the key here as one of the options is min underscore length, and then you just pass in a number as the value of the minimum number of characters length. So in this case, let's say it needs to have at least nine characters to be a password. So then we can save that, and there we have our password validators. Again, lots of options. If you scroll up this original link right here, it takes you to the password validation page where they show you a bunch of options you can use. So that's really all we need to do for now as far as setting up our password hashing and getting password validation. 
Later on, we'll show you how to deal with passwords as far as the actual models. But what I want to do is just a little bit of setup for future lectures of this section of the course is our template directory, our static directory, and something we haven't talked about yet, the media directory. So let's scroll back up here to where it says base directory, and we're going to add in three directories, or three variables really, template dir, and that's going to be os.path.join, and we're going to join the base directory with templates. We've done this before, so save that, and then scroll down, and make sure where it says templates, dirs, you also add in what you just made, the template dir, save that, and if I expand my tree, I actually want to make sure that I have the templates folder. So under the top level learning users here, I'm going to create a new folder and we will call it templates, hit enter. And I'm also going to create two more folders. One we've seen before, one we haven't. We've seen before that we added a static folder and that was to hold things like our CSS, our JavaScript, static files that don't change, images for your website, etc. So we have static and templates. And then another common folder you'll have here is called media. And the difference between the static folder and the media folder is you'll want to separate content that's static that you provided for your website versus content that may be static like an image that the user provided for the website. So imagine that you're creating a user profile and they can upload a profile picture. Well, that picture should be saved under that media folder instead of under the static folder. So static is stuff that belongs to you as the uh, website creator, administrator. Media is going to be stuff that more or less belongs to the users. So let's set that up as well. So if we scroll back here to our base directory and our template directory, we're gonna do a very similar process for the static underscore dir. That's going to be os.path.join. And here we're going to call again the base directory and join that with static. And then we'll do the same thing for media underscore dir and set it equal to os.path.join, say base directory, media. And if you're ever having any issues with settings as you're going through this section of the course, definitely check out the actual notes where everything's already filled out for you and you can run it and compare it. So then scroll all the way back to the bottom because there's a couple more things we need to add here as far as variables that Django's gonna be looking for. We have the static URL, so that's ready to go. But what we wanna do is add in a static files directory. So we'll say static underscore, whoops, static files underscore dirs, and then set it equal to a list with just static directory. And then we also want the basically the same thing for those media directories. So we'll say media underscore root is equal to media underscore dir. And then we'll also say media underscore URL is equal to, we'll say slash media slash, just like we did for static. Okay, save that and we'll hit up the settings.py file one more time when we start talking about uh, logins because we need to set up a login URL in the settings.py file. But for now, we're ready to go. So hopefully you learned how to select different hashing algorithms for your passwords and set them up in your settings.py file. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture where we begin talking about users. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Users Models Lecture. In this lecture, we'll discuss how to use Django's built-in tools to create user authorization models. And we'll also discuss more about how to set up the media files we saw previously into your project. Now previously when we've logged on to the admin page of any of our projects, we've seen that there's already a built-in authentication and authorization model set in place. And in this database, there were two things. One of them was groups and the other one was users. We're gonna learn how to use this feature of users. And previously you also may have heard me mention that sometimes it's not a good idea to call users uh, in your model. That is a model that you created. And the reason for that is you may get it confused with this users. Now they will show up differently in the admin as we saw earlier, but this is the kind of users we're talking about, the one that's built in into the authentication authorization model. So that specific user object has a few key features, and that is the username, the email, the password, the first name, and then the surname, which is the last name. And there are also some other attributes for the user object, such as, is it active? Is it staff? Is it a super user? And sometimes you'll also want to add more attributes to a user, such as their own links or a profile image, etc. 
So you can do this in your applications models.py file by creating another class that has a relationship to the user class. So let's see an actual example of what this code would look like. So here comes a giant screenshot. And this is what it looks like in your applications models.py file. First, we want to import that special user from django.contrib.authorization.models import user. So .auth .models. And then what we're going to do is create an actual model and we'll call it user profile info, something that expands off that user. Then we inherit from models.model. And then we create a relationship. We don't directly inherit from user. Instead, what we do is we create a one-to-one -one field relationship. And what that basically means is this extra user profile info has a direct one-to-one -one connection to the user model. And then we add in any additional attributes we want. So with the base user model, you already have the previous attributes I mentioned, the username, the email, the password, the first name, and the last name. But if you want your users to have other attributes to them in the models, you use this sort of extension of it by the one-to-one -one field relationship. And here's an example of what we're going to be doing, which is adding two things. One is a URL link for the user, which links to their portfolio. Let's say we're making some sort of website where they can link to their portfolio or their website, etc. That's what we're going to do here. So we say portfolio is equal to models.url field and we set blank equal to true there. So they don't have to fill it out. It's optional. And then the other one we do is picture or a profile picture, whatever you want to call that variable. And that's an image field. So what we're going to be doing with that is having the user, when they register to the website, actually be able to upload a profile picture, much like you would do on Facebook or maybe even like Gmail. And then we have the string method, which is just a built-in attribute of self.user.username. Remember, uh, the user attribute that's built into Django has that username. So what we end up doing is if you ever print out the user, it just returns back that username. Okay. So notice that one of the fields was something we haven't seen yet, an image field. So if I quickly go back here, that picture was a models.image field. Now this will allow you to store images to a model. And typically we will keep any user uploaded content like this in the media file. We previously created the media file in the last lecture. In order to work with images with Python, we also need to install the Python imaging library. And you can easily install that with pip install pillow. Now, sometimes users, especially maybe some Windows users on older Windows machines, may get an error on this command indicating something like JPEG support is disabled. If you have that error coming up when you say pip install pillow, add in these options here. So you can say pip install pillow dash dash global option build underscore ext and then space dash dash global dash option equals disabled JPEG. And this all goes in one line. And if you want to copy and paste this line, it's right in the notes. Okay, so once you've created that model of the, basically the extension of that user model, you have to remember to register it to the admin.py file with something like admin.site.register user profile info, where user profile info was imported from the models.py file. Now, typically images, those CSS, JavaScript files, etc., all go in the static folder of your project with that static root variable path defined inside of settings.py, which we did in the last lecture. And then the user uploaded content is going to go to the media folder with the media root. And then once you've set up your models and then your roots for static and media uh, uploads or output, what you want to do is set up the actual form. So again, you want to implement a Django form that the user can use to work with the website. And what we're going to do is show you a quick example of what this would actually look like inside the forms.py file of your application. So we already talked about the models.py. Now let's talk about the forms.py that the user is going to be using. So the code inside the forms.py file looks something like this. You say from Django import forms and then from the basic application you made dot models import that user profile info model. Then we create a new class. We'll say user profile info form, pass it in forms.model form as we saw in the other Django levels. And then we create the portfolio, the picture, pass that in as the URL field, the image field. And then we have this class meta that connects the model to the actual user profile info model. And then we can exclude something. And in this case, we can exclude a uh, user. Okay, so we've talked a lot, but this becomes a lot more clear when you actually see it all coded out. So what we're going to do in the next lecture is actually code out everything we just discussed. We'll code out the user model, uh, touch a bit on the media directory handling those images, and then about the user form. So media directory and handling images, we set up a lot of that in the previous lecture. So if you didn't watch the previous lecture all the way to the end, make sure you've set that up. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll see you at the next lecture where we're gonna start right from the Atom editor.
Hello everyone and welcome back. Here I am at the Atom Text Editor in my project folder under the application folder basic app. I've opened up the models.py file and this is where we're going to be actually working with the user model that we talked about in the previous lecture. So let's get started. The first thing we want to do is actually import that basic user model and that comes from django.contrib.auth for authorization models import and then we're going to import the user model. I'm actually going to collapse that directory trees just so we get a little more room here. And let's start creating that model. So we'll say class, and we're going to create a user profile info class. And that's going to inherit from models.model. And what we're going to be doing, the very first thing, is that user, this attribute user for the user profile info, is models dot a one to one field so that's one to one field with user itself and the reason for that is because this is basically a model class to add in additional information that the default user doesn't have remember the default user already has things like their username email password first name and last name but if you want to add more attributes to your actual user you can essentially almost like extending the class of this one to one relationship what you don't want to do is just directly inherit from the user class. That may seem really tempting, but doing that may screw up your database and thinking that it has multiple instances of the same user. So instead we'd use a one-to-one -one field relationship. Then below this are the additional classes. So for instance, if we want a portfolio site, so maybe this is a website where people post their portfolio projects of things they've been working on. We can say portfolio underscore site as one of the attributes for this model. And then we'll say models dot, and we'll call a URL field here. And we'll say, whoops, we'll say blank is equal to true. And that just means that the user doesn't have to fill it out. There's not gonna be an error if they don't provide a portfolio site. And then we want another one, another attribute that is called profile underscore pick. And that's going to be equal to models dot image field, and then we need to specify where we actually want to upload this to. And we're going to upload this to, and we'll set it equal to profile underscore picks as a string. And then we'll also set this blank equal to true. That way the user doesn't need to actually provide their profile picture at first if they don't want to. Now because we specified we want to upload to profile picks, that's going to be to need that's going to need to be a subdirectory in the media folder we created last time. So bringing up that directory tree, I have the media folder here. I'm going to expand this and then I'll say new folder. And under that, I'm going to call it profile underscore pics. Hit enter. And then when people upload their images or profile images, they're going to be saved here under media profile pics. Okay, so continuing on with our models, what I want to do is add in one more method, not an attribute, just for printing this out. So if I ever need to print out a model of a user profile info, I can get something back. So I'll take in self because it's a method. And here we'll just say return self.user.username, where username is that default attribute of this user. Because remember, we just said user is equal to models one to one field of user. All right. And that's actually all we need to do for our models.py. But as I mentioned, if you're gonna be working with images, we wanna make sure we have the pillow library installed. So here, in my virtual environment, I'm going to say pip install pillow. Hit enter, and it should collect pillow and install it. This may be a little bit of a longer installation than what you're used to, so keep that in mind. I'm going to hop forward in time until it finishes installing. All right, there it is and mine took less than 30 seconds, so hopefully yours is the same. And then check out the notes as well, especially on the models.py file. If you're getting an error that says something like uh, JPEG disabled, uh, there's a note in the previous lecture about what you need to do. You need to set some global options there. And if you want the actual line of code, check out the Django level five notes. It's under the models.py file. There's a line of code above the image field, so you can just copy and paste that. Anyways, that's models.py. Now let's create the form for our models.py file. So under our application, we'll say a new file and call it forms.py, hit enter. And now we're ready to actually work with the forms. 
So the first thing we need to do is say from Jingu import forms. Then we'll say from Django dot contrib dot auth dot models import whoops import user and then we'll import the model we made which was from basic app dot models import the user profile info and save that and now we're going to create two classes here one will be the user form and this is kind of the base form and this is going to be inheriting from forms dot model form review the Django level that talked about forms if this is a little fuzzy to you but we'll have here a password attribute that we want to kind of edit a bit and we'll say from forms or is equal to forms dot set it equal to a character field and this is going to be a widget equal to forms dot password input close parentheses and then finally we have that meta class that we talked about and we'll set the model equal to the user model and then the fields we want from the base user model I want the username and I want the email field and I want the password we won't be asking people for their last name or their first name but you could have added that, add that in if you want to next for class we'll say user profile info and again we inherit from forms dot model form and this one there's nothing I want to edit as far as the attributes are concerned so we'll just say class meta and we'll say the model is equal to user profile info and I will say the fields is equal to the two fields I want which are that portfolio site field and then the other field we made was that profile pick field okay save that and now your forms are ready to go one last thing we want to do though is actually register the model we created to the admin that way if we log in as an admin we can see the actual model so I will come to admin.py under basic app and I'm going to say here from basic app dot models I'm going to import uh, the user profile info that I created and then I'm going to say admin.site.register whoops that should be a lowercase r and I'm going to register that user profile info save that and we've created the models that we're going to be using essentially just that user profile which is a one-to-one -one match to the built-in user with Django the forms that's going to collect the information on the actual registration page and then the admin.py file and that is essentially part one of what we need to do to set up everything as far as the models and the forms part two of what we need to do is actually connect all of this to the templates so the home page the registration page the login page etc so we're going to end this here and we'll see you at the next lecture where we begin to discuss uh, how to expand off of this but ending this you should have models.py admin.py and forms.py ready to go inside of your application and remember whenever you edit the admin.py file or create a new model what you're going to want to do is down here at the bottom say python manage.py migrate hit enter and then once that's done what you see uh, you may see something like it says make migrations so you also need to do that you need to say python uh, whoops python manage.py make migrations and then the name of your application so basic app hit enter that's going to create some and then we'll say python manage.py migrate one more time and we're ready to go okay so thanks everyone i'll see you at the next lecture where we begin discussing how to connect all of this to the actual templates and those html files i'll see you there hello everyone and welcome back to part two of coding out the user models to actually fit the registration part of this project what we need to do is start working with the html so those templates what we're going to do is come over here to templates create a new folder we'll call it basic underscore app to match the name of our application and then under this I'm going to create a new file and I will call it base.html so it's going to be the base.html that we will be inheriting from I'll create another new file and we'll call this index.html that will be the actual index page 
then we'll create one new file and this will be registration.html so the registration page and then we haven't talked about it yet but after someone's registered they're going to want to log in and log out of the page so we'll create a new file called login.html and we won't work with that right now we'll have another discussion about logging in and logging out but right now we want to work on these three main files base index.html and registration and once we've done that we'll also edit the urls.py file of the project and create a urls.py file for our basic application well let's start off with the base which is going to have everything we need for the project so the first thing on the base.html page whoops i don't have that open i have registration here we go base.html page let me collapse this so i get a little more room is type html and let all the automatic input and we will just call this base for the title actually we won't give it anything uh, because we don't want to inherit the title block there you could make another block for a title block and then uh, inherit everything kind of separately the head and the body uh, that's totally a normal thing to do but we won't focus on that until we actually get to the clone projects because we don't care too much about uh, looking good right now what i'm going to say is uh, pass in the bootstrap uh, I mentioned we don't care about looking good, but we want to look a little bit good. So we pass in Bootstrap. And then I'm going to create a nav bar on this page just so we can quickly jump to links on the page. So this nav bar, it's going to be with the class equal to nav bar space nav bar dash default space nav bar dash static dash top. Then after that I'm going to make a div and that's going to be inside of a container class and then after that whoops then after that I'm going to create a unordered list and that's going to contain all the links so this unordered list is going to have a class of nav space navbar dash nav and you can always copy and paste this from the notes if you don't want to uh, watch me code this whole thing out so inside this unordered list are going to be the actual links to the other pages on the site. So we'll create three anchor tags and these anchor tags are going to have a class equal to either navbar dash brand or navbar dash link. So we'll say navbar dash brand. We'll have this link back to the actual home page. So we'll use template tagging for this. Hopefully remember from the template tagging lectures that we can just type in URL and then index if we set up the review or the urls.py file properly we haven't actually set the urls.py file so we'll have to do that and make sure it matches these uh, href url template calls but i will have here be the actual text say something like django or home whatever you want and then we'll create another list another anchor tag and this is going to be of a class as well we'll say class and this anchor tag is equal to navbar dash link and I'm going to copy and paste this because we're going to see it again right below to link to another page on the site so this will be the admin site and let's make this be the register site so for the actual registration then what we will do here is say under href create a URL tag and let me make sure I have the percent signs up here as well for the index page there we go under href here we'll say a URL template that looks for basic app and then what it returns is whatever's named the register view and then here we're going to say the same thing we'll call URL and then we'll say admin and then pass in index all right, so basically what we did is we set up a nav bar in the base.html and it links back to the home page with Django, links back to the admin page, and then links to the registration page, which we haven't actually created yet, but we will in just a second. Later on when we talk about login, we'll show how we can use template tagging to add a fourth link that will either say login or log out, depending on what the user is doing. But after all of this, outside of this nav bar, what I want to do is say template tagging, create a block, call this block the body block, and then I will also say end block. 
And anything inside of this, we'll just put them into a container. So for the other pages, everything that's going to be there will be inside a container. Obviously, that's optional, but for now, this should work for us for our base.html. Now let's focus on the other files, such as the home page. So the home page is just going to extend from that. So we'll say extends basic underscore app slash base.html. And I've noted a lot that you have to make sure the very first line in any HTML file is this doc type HTML. The reason I can just say extends here is because if I extend to this properly, the very first line should be doc type HTML, and then the second line will be HTML, etc. cetera. Uh, sometimes if you're a little paranoid, you can always just copy paste this onto the first line to double check, although you have it twice, doc type, doc type. But just make sure that it's the top of the base HTML and that the very first line is extends, and that should work fine as well. Up next, we want to actually call the body block that we made. So we'll say block and then body underscore block. And then we will say div jumbotron. I tend to really like jumbotrons. And we'll say Django level five as the home page. And then what we're going to do is continue on by calling the end block. So I will say end block right here. And block, save that. And now let's move on to the registration page. So we have registration. And what's going to happen here is we also are going to extend. I'm going to say extends from basic app slash base.html. And then I'm going to set up the actual registration form that's on the page. So this is going to look a little bit different, but usually you're going to want to import uh, some files. So maybe we want to import or load static files. We don't really have any, but just to show you what this would typically look like if you had static files, maybe you want to import uh, some images like um, welcome to the page, like your brand image or whatever on your registration page. Uh, typically you would need to load those static files in. And then we're going to call block body block. And whenever you do that, you also want to call in an end block. And now let's actually put in the form. So we'll say div, this is a jumbotron. And what we're going to do is have some logic here. And the logic is going to look like this. And this will make more sense when we talk about the views and the context dictionaries we return. But it's going to say if registered, meaning the context dictionary returns something that says registered. And because I have an if, I want to make sure I have an end if. So we'll say if registered, this person is going to say thank you, or this site is going to say thank you for registering, exclamation mark. And then because I have an if, I can have an else here. I will say else, so this person is not registered, then we're going to actually display the HTML for registration, which is something like register here. And then let's pass in the actual file. We'll say fill out the form. And then we need to make the form using template tagging. So first we want to have the actual form. We don't need a class and we don't need an action. We can take care of that later. What we do want to make sure is that the method is equal to post. And because we're using multimedia data that we're uploading, such as the image file, we need to say ENC type is equal to, and we're going to say multi-part slash form data. So make sure you have that, otherwise the image uploading won't work. So we can have that, and usually you want the method to be last, although that doesn't actually affect it, just for readability, having this is more common. And then what we're going to do is call in our CSRF token. CSRF underscore token. And then call in the parts of the form. So remember that form we created, we can say user form as underscore P. That's the base user form that's going to ask for if we go back to the forms.py. So remember user form, we're asking for the username, the email, and the password. Then we need to call the user profile info form for the portfolio site and their profile pic. So coming back to registration, 
And then once we grab those attributes from the base user form, I'm going to also want to grab stuff from my profile form as underscore P. And this term user underscore form and profile underscore form, those are going to be defined within the context dictionary of the views. So we haven't actually done that yet. So we'll type in an input. This is going to be a submit type. It doesn't need to have a name, but it does want to have a value. So we'll say register. And that's the end of our form. So pretty simple so far. So we will save this. And what we've done so far in this lecture is set up three main HTML files. We set up our base.html file, has a nav bar, which has the links with the URLs on them. And then it also has the body blocks, the index page. This is just the home page, not much here except for welcome to Django level five, essentially. And then registration.html, which has the tokens, user forms, and profile forms. So these are things from the views sending back the context dictionary that we haven't actually worked with yet. Before we actually conclude this lecture, let's set up the urls.py files to match up. And then in the next lecture, we'll actually talk more about the registration and what the views.py file is going to look like. So let's start by jumping to the actual project urls.py file, which I have open here. We'll scroll down and set everything up. So what I want to do is say import URL, and I will also import include, import admin, and then I want to say from basic underscore app, import views. Now we haven't worked at all with the views.py file. In fact, if we take a look at it, it's totally empty. But so far, this is just going to be a bunch of functions that we need to fill out later. So right now, we'll uh, kind of assume the names of those functions and then work backwards to them. Let's set up the home page since that's pretty easy every time. We'll set up URL. And then using regular expressions, I just want to say just the domain name, views.index. And we'll give it the name index. Let's set up a couple more views. We'll set up the admin page to be URL. Oh, that's actually already set up for us. Never mind. Let's set up URL, um, anything that has to do with basic app. So we'll say r caret here, basic underscore app slash, and then I'm just going to call include the basic underscore app dot URLs. Okay, and then we'll talk about logging in and logging out later on. But these three views should work for now. And if we come over to uh, our basic app, it doesn't have a urls.py file yet that will match up to include here. So let's create it. We'll say basic app, new file, urls.py. And now let's actually do the urls.py file for our application. First, we need to say from django.conf dot urls import url and then we'll say from basic app import views again you can just say from dot import views it's up to you and since we're using template tagging or i should say template urls remember we need to set up the app name variable so here say something like app name is equal to and then it has to match the actual application name in our case, it's basic app. And then we'll create some URL patterns. And the patterns we are going to create is one for someone who's the about to register. So we'll say r caret register slash dollar sign. And then this will call views. And we'll have a function in there called register. We haven't made it yet, but we'll create it in a little bit. And then we'll say register there. So we'll still add more to this later on, but this should be a nice uh, cutting off point. So let's quickly review everything we did. We set up base.html, index.html, and registration.html. And those are linking to the actual context dictionaries that we're going to return back when we work with the views.py file. Then we also set up the basics of our urls.py for both the project and the application. We're not done with them yet. We'll still add more stuff to them when we talk about working with the login page. But now coming up next is the majority of the work and a lot of it happens right here with the views.py file. So thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture where we talk about the views.py file and setting up the registration here. Hello everyone and welcome to the registration lecture for Django level five. A lot of the coding for working with users and authorization happens in the views.py file. The basic idea is that we check if there is a post request and then perform some sort of action based off that information. 
Sometimes we will want to save that information directly to the database. Other times, we will set commit equal to false inside of the save method so we can manipulate the data before saving it to the database. This helps prevent collision errors from saving it twice. So instead, we just commit equal to false the first time and then save it after we're done manipulating the data. Figuring out the registration views is an extension of what we learn about when discussing Django forms. So make sure to review that content if you don't remember it. This entire process is best shown through code, so we're going to jump to our views.py file and code through it all. We will also fix a small mistake made in the previous lectures when working with the forms and how to keep an eye out for those errors. So we'll start by fixing that small mistake and then we'll jump to the views.py file. Let's get started. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor and I have my views.py file open and I can also check my forms.py file and there's actually a small error in this file. And we're gonna walk through how we can discover this sort of error with working with views.py. So what I'm going to do is start off by creating the most basic view, which is our index view. That's for the home page. So I will say request, and then I'm going to return render, and I will say request, and then pass in basic app slash index.html. And then the next view I wanna make is for the registration page. And we'll start off by saying def, and we'll call this view register. It's going to take in a request and we'll create a variable called registered and I will set it equal to false. And I'm going to depend on this variable to tell if someone's been registered yet or not. And then I will say if request.method is equal to post, here's what we'll do. And I should say two equal signs here because I'm checking for equality. What we're going to do is get information from both of the forms, just like we would with any other form. So I will create a variable called user underscore form, and this matches the variable I'm going to send back with the context dictionary. And this will grab information from the user form. And we'll set data is equal to request.post. And then the other form we had was the profile underscore form. And we'll set this equal to user profile info, and this is where I caught that mistake. So notice here, I want the user form and the user profile info form. And then I want this data to be equal to request.post. But I notice that since I'm using the forms, I should import the forms. So I come back up here and I go to import them, and this is where we're gonna kind of catch a little bit of a glitch or error. I'll say from basic app.forms, import the user form, comma, import, and I see here user profile info. But remember, the user profile info is our model. So if I come to models.py, I have user profile info as the model. I shouldn't have that as the same name here under the forms.py file, where I have the user form and then user profile info. So what I need to fix is change this to say, instead of user profile info, be user profile info form then save that, and then come back up here to views.py and change this from user profile info to user profile info form, and then save that. So the main mistake here that was made was instead of saying user profile info form, we accidentally used the same model name. And that's kind of a big no-no. What you should do instead is always add some sort of term form when you're dealing with a model form. That way it doesn't get confused on this line where it says model is equal to the form name. Otherwise it thinks it's a self-referential call. All right, if you have any questions on that, feel free to post to the Q&A forum. There should have been a note about that, however, before you even saw the mistake being done. So we'll come back to views.py and continue working on this. I'm going to collapse the tree so we see a little more room. So I have that user form, that profile form created, those two variables. Now I wanna check if both forms are valid. And if you ever have questions on any of these steps, you can always reference the note code as well. So I will say user underscore form is valid and profile form is underscore valid. And this is where we're gonna do stuff if they're valid. So we'll do some different actions with the user form versus the profile form. 
So I'm going to set the user equal to user underscore form, and I will save that information directly to the database. Then I'm going to say user, and I will call a set password method on this, and I will set user dot password. And this is essentially hashing the password. So it goes into your settings.py file and it sets it as the hash. And then after this, we're going to say save. So basically what this is happening is we're grabbing the user form, saving it to the database. Then we're hashing the password by saying set password method. And then we save that hashed password to the database. So we save those changes to the user. And now we want to actually deal with that extra information. Remember that was their website link and their profile picture. So we will say profile is equal to profile underscore form. And I'm going to say dot save, but here is where I'm going to pass in commit is equal to false. I don't want to commit to the database yet. Otherwise I may get errors uh, with collisions where it tries to overwrite this user. So what we're going to do instead is say profile dot user is equal to user. And that sets up that one-to-one -one relationship. So if you come back to models, remember over here, the user profile info, that user is equal to a one-to-one -one relationship with the user here. So this one-to-one -one relationship is defined in the views with this line of code. Profile.user is equal to user, which is the user form, which if we come back here is this original form model equals user. So follow out the steps. It's a little hard to show because it's kind of all three of these files linking at the same time, but hopefully you can kind of get the idea of how we're relating that extra profile information, those extra attributes to the original one-to-one -one relationship. And then what we want to do is check if they actually provided a profile picture. And we will say if profile underscore pick in request.post, excuse me, request.files, because it's an actual file, we will say profile.profile pick is equal to request.files. And this is basically a dictionary of all the files they uploaded in the request. So you'll use very similar tactics when dealing with other types of files, not just images, but if they want to upload a CSV, a PDF, their resume, etc., you're going to be saying request.files to actually find those. And you'll be dealing with the key based on what you defined in the models. So we'll say if the profile pick in request.models, we set the attribute profile pick equal to the request.files, which is kind of acting like a dictionary, and then profile pick. And then we're going to save the model after doing that. So we'll say profile, save. And if they've done all of this, so both forms are valid, we save the user and we save their profile, set up their picture, then I'm going to set registered equal to true. So the registration was successful. Else, what I'm going to do is print the error. So if I get an else statement here, that means the forms were invalid. So one of the forms or both of the forms were invalid. And what we can do in this case is just print out the error. So I can say user form errors. And then we can also just do this almost like a tuple. So we'll say profile form errors. And there's more, other, there's other ways we can deal with that later on. We'll show, especially during the clone projects, but right now we can just print out the actual errors. And then we'll say else, and this else lines up not with this if, but over here with the if request.method is equal to post. So in this else, that means the request was on an HTTP request. So they didn't actually post anything. So what we'll do here is set everything up. So we'll say user form is equal to an instance of user form. And we'll say profile form is equal to an instance of the user profile form or user profile info form. And then once this is all done, we're going to return a render of the request and then what we want to do is show them what file we want to import this into. And this is the registration file. So registration.html, let me confirm that's what I called that. Uh, looking under templates, basic app, 
yes, it is registration.html. So that's good. And then finally, I need to pass in the context dictionary. So if I take a quick peek at registration.html, remember we used uh, several things here. We used user form, profile form, and then registered. So those are three things I need to pass along in the views.py file as my context dictionary. So the first thing, and we can actually start this on a new line, just so it's a little more organized. The first key is that user form, and that's just going to be equal to the user form we created. The second key value pair I want is the profile form. Again, that's just going to be the profile form we created. And then finally, the third thing I want is that registered key value pair, and that again matches up with registered. And it's very common to have the context dictionary keys match up exactly with the values. That way it's really readable and you remember what is what. Okay, so that is it for the registration view. Now, as I mentioned, it is a lot of coding and it's going to be kind of another round of a lot of coding when we talk about logging in and logging out. But if we scroll up here, we should be able to see the steps. So first we have the registration view. We check if they're registered, it's we set it equal to false, so we kind of assume at first uh, they're not registered. And then if the request is equal to post, we grab the information off the forms. We check if both forms are valid. If so, we grab everything from the base user form. Then we grab the profile form, and we gotta double check that to see if there's a picture in there before we actually save it. And then we set registered as equal to true. If they did type in a post there, but there was an error, so they were both not valid or one of them was not valid, then we'll just print out the errors. And then else, so that means there was no request yet, so the request method is not equal to post, then we just set the forms. So we'll set user form and the profile info form. And then finally, we return the render. Okay, so let's save all of this and let's actually test this out. I'm sure there'll be some bugs we have to fix, but let's see how we do. So I'm going to clear this whoops, it should be CLS. And then what I'm going to do is say Python manage.py, and I'm going to, just for safety, because I was fixing some of those mistakes, I'm going to migrate. All right, so no migrations apply, but let's also check with the make migrations command, basic app. So there's no problem of kind of being extra paranoid about this with uh, running these migrate commands, even if you don't think you need to. So there we go. It's okay, so we applied all migrations. We should be good, which means I'm going to actually try to run the server. So we'll say python manage.py, run server, and let's see if we get any errors. Well, no errors on actually running the code. Let's see if we get an error on the website. So bringing in the website, looks like that is working as well. Let's see if the registration page works. Click on register. Okay, so register is also working. It says username and there's some auto stuff that gets filled out based off the validation requirements. So we'll say new user, email address, we'll just say hello at gmail.com, password, this can be whatever. I'll type in test password, portfolio site, I'll say https www.google.com and check out the documentation uh, for validation of these inputs. We discussed inputting uh, or validation input when we were talking about forms in another Django section of the course, but for actual URL fields, it usually requires you to say HTTPS. So most people uh, won't put that in and it will give an error. So what you can do is when actually working with that file in the views, you can check if it starts with that. If not, you can just inject it in. Then for the profile pick, uh, you can just choose any file. I won't choose one for now. Instead, I'm just going to click register and see if it works. So we hit register, great, and it says thank you for registering. So what we need to do is actually check if this person now is in our database. But in order to do that, if I click on admin, uh, we need a super user. So let's go and create that. So I'm gonna drag this guy away and let's do control C to kill this. And then I will say Python manage.py create super user, hit enter. And we'll say Jose, like usual. Um, any email address is fine. So training at peerandata.com. And then password, I'll use test password. 
test password. Okay, super user was created successfully. Now let's run the server again. So we'll say python manage.py run server. Going to come back to the home page and bring it in. So there's our home page, and we should have already registered that person. So let's click on admin, type in our username, and then type in the password, log in, and see if we get everything. Okay. So here we have our basic app. And if you don't see this, it's because you probably forgot to actually register on the admin.py file. So make sure you do that. But we'll hit user profile info. Great, we have that new user. We can click on it and we can see all their information. User, portfolio site, profile pic, that looks good. So let's go back. And if we go to, whoops, home, under site administration, we can hit here on users. And now we have Jose, which is me, this super user. And then we have the new user, which is at hello at gmail.com. And if we click on that new user, we can see their quote unquote password, but we actually can't see the password. And that's because of the hashing algorithms we used. And the particular hashing algorithm we used with that argon2 makes this uh, pretty secure. Uh, in fact, it's very, very secure. And you can see that even some of the information is censored to us as a super administrator. So there is no way to actually get this user's password. And essentially there's no way if someone ever uh, asked for your password that you would ever be able to give it to them. So this is so secure that even you as the administrator are not gonna be able to see their password. You can see their salt, their hash, uh, some of it's censored, etc. but you're never gonna actually be able to give back the user their password. If you do wanna change the password, uh, you can eventually set this up automatically, but you can hit this form and create a new password and then enter that password again and then change the password. What you'll never be able to do is just tell the user what their original password was. The security is too high for you as a super user to even find that out. Okay, so there's some other information here and we'll talk about uh, more stuff with Django administration in a future lecture, but successfully we registered someone to the site, which is pretty awesome. Coming up next, what we wanna talk about is them logging in and logging out of the site. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to the Logins Lecture. Once a user is registered, we want to make sure that they can log in and out of the site. In this lecture, we will go through the entire process of creating login and log out functionality for users that are registered in your database. This process involves the following main criteria. We need to set up special login views and also show you how you can create views for access. And we can do that with built-in decorators. So a lot of that functionality Django makes really easy for you things like making sure certain views require a login can all be done with a simple decorator call. Then we also need to make sure to add in the login URL in our settings.py file. We need to actually create the login page, and then we want to edit the urls.py file to actually match the URL mappings to our login.html. Okay, let's get started. Okay, here I am at my Atom Text editor, and the first thing we need to do to actually set up logins is to set up our login URL. So we want one dedicated page for the user to log in from. So what we're going to do is go to settings.py and scroll all the way down on this. So I can actually go all the way down. And at the bottom, what we're going to do is just like we added static URL and media URL, I'm going to add one more variable in here called login underscore URL and set it equal to the login page. In our case, that's going to go under the basic app folder under templates, and then we'll call this user login. So we will save that and file that under settings. The next thing we can do is set up our HTML files. So coming back to basic app, we have our base.html and our login.html. And we're going to play around with both of these. The base HTML to actually add in the login link and log out. But for the login HTML, we can start with that right away. So first we want to actually extend. So we will say extends and this extends from basic app slash base.html and then we'll call the body block block body block and then we also want to have an end block whenever we call that so we'll say end block here and then what we're going to do is call a container actually I don't believe we need to do that because the base calls a container on the body itself. So we can go directly into a Jumbotron class. 
And this is just going to be where the user can log in. So let's put a header in here that says, please log in. And if you were doing this on your own website, you could add a button that takes you to the registration page that says something like register here. But let's start our, whoops, let's create a form. And the form, we don't need it to have a class for now. And what we're going to do is actually show you how you can play around with the action this time. So what we're going to do is on the action, I'll call a URL template tag, and I'm going to pass in basic app and then user underscore login. So the URL template tag is going to go to basic app user login. And this will make more sense when we actually see it in the views, but keep it in mind for now. We'll come back to this later. And then with any form, remember we need the CSRF token. So we'll type in CSRF underscore token. And then let's create some labels here. So this is going to use kind of more HTML style form because we don't actually create a form for the login. At least we didn't in our case. So let's create a username and then we'll say username. So that's the label for the username. Hopefully this feels really familiar. Kind of like a blast from the past from the HTML sections of the course. Username is just a text and then we'll give it the name username. So it matches up with that label. And then it doesn't need a value, but we can give it a placeholder. And the placeholder can say enter username. And then what we're going to do is create another entry for the actual password. So we'll say for password, and then we'll have that person pa type in their password there. And then we'll give it an input of password. Call it password. And it doesn't need a value, and it doesn't need a placeholder because it's a password. And then finally, we'll have an input for submit. So let's give it the value of login. All right, and this is actually basically all we're gonna have in our login page. So a couple of things here, we're using a lot of the HTML that we learned about for actually grabbing the information. We aren't importing from the forms.py file because it's such a basic form. And also we're calling a form to action. So note here, we're calling URL basic app user login. And we'll show why we do that later on. And then we're also going to be playing around with the base.html file. What we're going to do is inside of the base.html file, we won't do it yet, but we will come back to this later, is we'll have a link that either says log in or log out, depending on if the person who has already registered is logged into your site or not. But to do all of this, we really need to start focusing on the views.py file. And that's again where a lot of the logic is going to be taking place. And it's where we're going to be doing the majority of our coding for this actual lecture. So let's go over to views.py in our basic app. And we're going to be typing a lot here, so be prepared for it. If you ever need a reference, you can always check out the notes. So first thing, we're going to do a lot of imports because we're going to be using a lot of Django's built-in functionality. So we will say from Django.contrib.url resolvers going to import reverse and we'll show how to use that in just a little bit but then oh whoops this actually should not be from contrib this should be from core there we go so from django.core.url resolvers import reverse and now we're going to say from django.contrib.auth for authorization decorators. And I mentioned that there are a lot of decorators that make your life a lot easier. And one of them is called login underscore required. And this is basically something that's super awesome about Django. If you ever want a view to require the user to be logged in, you can decorate it with this login underscore required. And Django has a bunch of authorization decorators that really help you out like that. The main one being login required. And then what we're going to do is to keep things a little more simple. Instead of using render, we'll use the HTTP response. And we'll also do an HTTP response redirect, which we may not have seen before. But we'll say from Django.http import HTTP response redirect, comma, and we'll also import HTTP response. 
whoops, response. So we've already seen this guy a bunch of times, especially back in the beginning, but we haven't seen redirect, so we'll see that as well. And then finally, we'll say from chango.contrib.auth for authorization, import, and then here are the three kind of key functions, which are authenticate, login, and log out. All right, we can save that. And now let's actually go and create our login view for the user login page. And then we'll show you how to use um, this decorator to show you kind of like a simple example of sp some pages where the user login is required. So let's start off by going all the way down here under register and creating a new view. I'm going to put in a bunch of new lines here and we will collapse the directory tree, give us a little more room and I will say def user underscore login, and I'll pass in request. And as a quick note, sometimes Django can complain if you decide to call your view login, especially if you're importing, if you scroll all the way up here, if you're importing login, then you don't want to overwrite it here in the views file. So make sure that the view doesn't share a name with anything you're importing. So don't call a view authenticate login or log out or login required. So here, um, try to make it something a little more unique. So here we're calling it user underscore login. And then this is actually going to look pretty similar to the request. It's a lot of code, um, excuse me, pretty similar to the registration. Again, it's a lot of code, but it'll get the job done. So we'll say request method, if request method is equal to post, then the user has actually filled out the login information. So the first thing we need to do is get the username and password supplied. So I will grab from the request dot post and I can use the dot get method and get the name of that. So the reason I use the dot get is because over in our login.html file, we're just using simple HTML and we called it name equals username. So I'm going to get from that post username. And then I'm going to create a variable called password is equal to request.post.get password. And then we're going to use Django's built-in authentication function, and this makes your life really easy. So all the work of the authentication is going to happen for you automatically. So we'll say user authenticate, and then we pass in username equal to username, and then the password equal to password. And again, sometimes Django complains if you just pass in username, comma, password. So actually tell it the variable, username is equal to username, password is equal to password. So type in what the parameters are equal to. And this will basically automatically authenticate this user for you, which is awesome. One line of code. Thank you, Django. And then if we have a user, so I will say if user, so remember user is going to check if they're actually um, right here authenticated then what I'm going to do is check if the account is active. So later on, especially in the clones, we'll talk about um, deactivating users if they've spent too much time off the site or having them reactivate their accounts, et cetera, in case they lost their password. But right now we'll say if they're a user, so they pass the authentication process. And then if the user is active, we're going to log the user in. And that again is one simple function. Thanks to a lot of the built-in stuff of Django. We just say log in, that function we imported, and then pass in the request, and then pass, through the, pass in the user object that was returned by authenticate. And then we're going to send that user back to some page. So once they're logged in, you send them somewhere. Sometimes it'll be their own profile page, their home page, etc. And we use HTTP response redirect to redirect them to some other page. And we can redirect them and call reverse on index. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to do a redirect. If they log in and it's successful and their account is active, it will reverse them and redirect them back to the home page. And then else, so if their account is not active, we'll return HTTP response. And it won't be a redirect, it'll just be a response. And we'll give them something back like account not active. And then on this if user call, we can say else, we might want to print something out just for us in the console. So something like someone tried to log in and failed. And we can also print 
if you want to, username. So again, this is a very simple site, so you probably wouldn't want to do something so direct on your site, but I'm going to print out maybe someone malicious tried to log in with a username and password, but it wasn't right. So we could either uh, print this out straight into the console or have some sort of error log, and we'll talk about logging later on in the course. But we can say something like print username and password dot format uh, username and password. So this will basically be um, what they tried to log in with. Now it's not so bad that we print it out because technically this username and password combination isn't already in our database. And then we'll say return an HTTP response of invalid login details supplied. So else, which means the request.method wasn't equal to post, so they haven't actually uh, submitted anything, then we just return the actual render of the request and then the login page, which is at basic app slash login.html. And we can pass in just an empty context dictionary if you want. So we'll save that. And then you should be ready to go for user login. And now what I want to show you is imagine what a page would look like if you want to require the login. So we'll scroll all the way up and add two more functions here. It's kind of up to you where you want to add these views. And if you get overpiled of views here, sometimes some people separate them into different views and then import them all here. But right now we're keeping things so basic that we'll just add in two more views. These are uh, much smaller, but we want a logout. So we'll call this DEF user underscore logout. We don't want to call it just logout because if you notice, we imported logout. So we'll call it user underscore logout instead. This takes in a request. And what this happens is you pass in the request to that built-in logout function, and that automatically logs out the user. And then we return an HTTP response, redirect, reverse back to the index page. So pretty simple, except for one thing. We want to make sure that only a user who is logged in can log out. The way we have it right now is a little confusing because it doesn't actually require a user to be logged in in order to log out. So this would probably cause some issues and problems with the page. And this is what's really awesome about Django. In order to make sure that any view requires a person to be logged in to see it, all you do is decorate it with this login required that we imported. So you say at and review the, decor the decorators lecture if you don't remember how to do this, but you just call it directly above the function. And it has to be directly, so one line above. So if I'm on line 16, the at should be at line 15. So here we see at login required. And now suddenly this entire view has a login required. So let's imagine that you had some sort of uh, special page or you wanted to return something special. Just to kind of reiterate this, you have some other page that requires a login and you can say something like return an HTTP response that says you are logged in. Nice. All you have to do is say in order to make sure that view requires a login is pass in login required as a decorator. And that's what's uh, pretty awesome about Django, the fact that authenticate login and logout and login required are super easy to call. It's just a function call for login and logout, and it's just a decorator for login required. And that's really what's going to save you a ton of time when you're developing your own web applications. I know the process to actually understand how to use those takes a long time, but once you understand how to use them, the process of using them uh, definitely shortens your development cycle. Okay, so views.py should be taken care of now. Let's go and make sure our URLs actually point to the user login page. So let's come back to our URLs in our project and scroll all the way down. So right now it points to admin basic app and then the home page, the index page. And what we can do here is add in something for, let's say the logout page and that special page we just uh, kind of made, that silly view. So we'll do something for logout since that's actually what we're going to be using. And we'll say logout slash dollar sign. And we'll just say get views dot user logout view. And we will give it the name equal to logout. And if you want to see an example of setting that special view that someone requires to be logged in, um, and as a practice problem, if you want, you can 
set another HTML to go to this special page, but we'll say special slash views dot special name is equal to special. So that's some sort of uh, special page that we haven't really done anything with that theoretically a user would have to be logged in to even see this page. Okay, so that's what the project would look like now as far as the urls.py file. The main thing note that we added is this logout page for the user logout. Let's come to our project, or excuse me, our applications urls.py file. Right now we only have that register view. What I want to add in is the login view. So we'll say url r caret user login slash dollar sign and then I'm going to say views dot user underscore login and we'll give it the name user underscore login. Save that and now our URL patterns is done. So we have something pointing to the login page and the logout page. But what I'm going to do before we actually get started is come to base.html and over here add in another link with some logic to have the user either log in or log out once they've registered. And the way we're going to do that is I'm going to zoom out just a tiny bit and also collapse this directory tree to get a little more room here so I can show you what I'm going to be doing. So I want some logic to actually display one more list item, which means I'm going to use template tags. So I have Django, I have admin, I have register, and I'm going to say this. If user is authenticated. Let me make sure I spell that right. A-U authenticated. And basically what this says is, okay, the user passed that authentication function that we called in the view. So if you go back to view and scroll all the way down to the login. So here's user, right? And then here is authenticate. And what we're going to say is if that user is authenticated, then we're going to do something here. I'll add in a list item to that nav bar. It's going to be an anchor tag. It'll have the same class. The class will be navbar dash link. And then the href is going to be to, whoops, let's make sure we do this right, a URL template tag to log out. And if we look back at our project, so under learning user, we have logout here. Its name is logout. So that's what we're pointing to here under our template tagging. So URL logout. And then let's give it some actual text, text which says log out. Else, so let's imagine that the user was not authenticated. Then I'm going to say create a list item, create an anchor, and we'll give it the href. Well, first let's give it the class so it looks the same as everything else. That's again a navbar dash link. And it's going to have an href of URL. So it's another URL template. And it goes to the basic app and it finds the user login view. Okay. So remember in the urls.py file for application over here, we named this user login and it's under basic app and that leads the actual user login view for the URL mapping, which means I need to add one more line of code here and hopefully you guessed it, it's the end if. So whenever you have an if, you need to have an end if. And I'm not using any sort of uh, plugins that help me autocomplete Django. I definitely suggest those on your own computer when you're kind of developing instead of learning. I'm not using any here as far as Django plugins because I want to manually code everything out to explain everything. On my own personal computer, when I'm not teaching, I definitely have a lot of plugins that do special autocomplete and highlighting syntax here. Okay, so let's add one line of text here that says login and save this. Let's run the server and see if we actually got everything to work and we'll debug if we have to. I'm going to say CLS. And then let's start typing python manage.py run server, hit enter. And that's good news. It's actually attempting to run something. So let's copy this and bring in our browser. 
And what I'm going to do is bring that here. And let's register a new user to make sure that still works. And so I can actually remember how this person's going to log in. So we will create a username. We'll call him Sammy. Email address Sammy at gmail.com. Whoops, gmail.com. We'll give them a test password. And then their portfolio site. Uh, we can just provide one, it doesn't really matter. We'll give it Google. You can upload a picture. And let's actually get some practice uploading a picture. So I could say choose file and let's upload this picture of the GitHub Octocat and let's register. So it says, thank you for registering. That looks good. Let's log in as an admin and verify that that person registered successfully. Put in your super username. And then let's check on the user profile info. There's Sammy. And here we can see they have their profile pic and they're at google.com for their portfolio site. So we will log out. And now let's go back to the home page, and let's log in as Sammy. So it says enter username. We'll type in Sammy. And then let's enter their password, test password. And we should be redirected to the home page. And note what else happened. Now we get this changed to log out. So I'll show you that again. If I click log out, it changes to log in. We could also have that redirect to another page if we wanted. But then I can hit log in, it says log in, I enter Sammy, test password, hit log in, and now I see the log out change. Great. And then I can always click log out, and that can redirect to some sort of thank you for visiting page. And that's basically all there is for logging in and logging out. Later on in some of the clone projects, we'll also talk about sessions, but maybe as a good exercise for you is to see if you can have a link and create a navbar link to the special page that we created. So we created a view called special and linked it in the URLs, but we never actually really did anything with it. It was just to check that someone had to be logged in to see it. This entire process of creating users, having them log in, log out, register, and creating sessions for each user is something we're going to explore a lot more during the clone project. So we'll definitely get a lot more practice with this, but hopefully you saw the very basics are actually quite simple thanks to Django. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to Django Deployment. So welcome to the Django Deployment section. Before we continue, I really want to tell you that there's still so many topics to learn that we're going to cover in this course. Things like ORMs, advanced user authorization, social logins, that means logging into the site with like Facebook or GitHub, payments, REST APIs, encryption, testing sessions, cookies, class-based views, and so much more. So don't worry, we're still going to tackle a lot of these topics, but for right now, we're going to cover those topics in a mix of clone projects and advanced Django topics in future sections. I think by now you've learned enough that if you really wanted to, you could go out on your own, reference online sources and documentation to build whatever web application that you had in mind. So for now, we're going to mark a milestone in our knowledge by learning how to actually deploy our Django projects. Before we continue, I want to quickly discuss deployment options in general. There are many, many options for deploying your site, and each option is going to come with a trade-off on things like price, scalability, security, ease of use, etc. Please check the resource links in this lecture for full instructions on how to deploy Django to a wide variety of platforms. What I've done is I've Google searched and found the best step-by-step -step guides for a wide variety of Django platforms. Things like Elastic Beanstalk, Heroku, PythonAnywhere.com, etc. And each guide is a clear step-by-step -step walkthrough of deploying on a platform. So for this lecture, we're going to show you how to use the deploy functionality with a very simple and easy to use host called PythonAnywhere.com. Later on, we can talk about things like deploying to a VPS like DigitalOcean or another hosting service like Heroku. And definitely check out the resource links for full step-by-step -step guides on how to do those sort of deployments. Understanding the basic process on a simple site like pythonanywhere.com will really help you when it comes to deploying on more technical platforms like Elastic Beanstalk on AWS. And as you continue on through the course and you're interested in deploying to a particular platform or service, usually just a simple Google search of the service name plus Django results in many guides. 
It is in the best interest of these services that a well-written deployment guide is available. Otherwise, they won't make any money because if users find it hard to deploy on their website or service, they're just not going to use it. So at this point in time, basically every major hosting service that's a good fit for Django has a really well-written guide. So again, check the resource links. I've linked uh, some of the best ones here. And keep that in mind as you explore a wide range of options. I understand that PythonAnywhere.com isn't going to work for everybody on their applications or for their startup, etc. So this is more of a general guide on how to deploy something. Whether you actually end up using PythonAnywhere.com for your own web projects is really up to you. All right, so it's time to show the world what we've created, and we're going to get started with deploying that Django project. But first, we'll need to learn how to use GitHub to host our code and go through a deployment checklist. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture where we're going to be covering GitHub. I'll see you there. Hello everyone. Before we actually begin working with Python Anywhere to deploy our site, we need to talk about GitHub, Git, and a version control. When we think about deploying our project, it will probably be useful to have all our code hosted somewhere online. This way we can easily call it from the virtual server or hosting service we are using. So before we actually do that, let's talk about what is Git and what is GitHub. A really common misconception for beginners is that Git and GitHub are the same thing. They are not. Git is a version control system that helps keep track of changes in your code. GitHub is a company and the website that helps manage Git and hosts your files on their site. Git is an open source, totally free version control system. GitHub is a company that utilizes that and adds extra tools on top of that and hosts your files, your code on their site. They offer extra tools for collaboration and things of that manner. So the main idea for us is that you can have one repository with various historic checkpoints that you can always refer back to with a history of any changes. And that is what is known as version control, a different control over all the various versions of a particular file you had. GitHub is one of the most popular code hosting sites on the web, and it allows you to easily use Git for version control and keep hosted copies of your code on the web. And the first step is for you to go to GitHub and create a free account. Then we'll download Git to our computer and upload our project repository to GitHub. If you're already a student that knows how to use GitHub and create and upload to a repository, just upload your project folder to the repo you make and skip to the next lecture. For everyone else, let's go to github.com, explore how to use Git, and get everything set up online. I'll see you at github.com. Okay, so here I am at GitHub. GitHub basically offers two levels of service. One is free, and the free level of service basically works almost exactly the same as the paid version, except for the paid version, you get to keep your files private. If you're not paying and it's free, then you have to publicly host everything so anyone can see your code. Obviously, if you're a corporation or a company or you want to keep your code hidden from other people because it has proprietary knowledge, you would have to pay GitHub to host your stuff on there. Right now, we'll just focus on the free GitHub account. So what you're going to do is if you don't have one yet, click sign up and then sign up for GitHub. You'll set up a personal account, username, email address, password, choose your plan. It'll be a free plan. And then step three, uh, some tailor your experience stuff. So don't worry about that. All right. So once you've signed up, then go ahead and sign in. I'm going to sign in right now. And you'll get something that looks similar to this. You probably won't have everything that I have here. You can see that with github.com, you can collaborate with other people and it will show their changes. So for example, here's a co-instructor of mine and there's his GitHub account and he's working on a project with me. So if I click on this, it'll take me to the project we're working on and I can actually view the changes. So in green is what is currently there and in red is what was removed or deleted. So that's basically the way you can collaborate with people on GitHub. And this is also really nice because pretty much every major open source project is now being hosted on GitHub. So if you ever want to contribute to Django or any other open source project, you can do it on GitHub with your account. But what we're going to be doing is setting up a repository. So we will click right here on new repository and you'll give this a repository name. So something short and memorable. So we will call this Django dash deployments dash example. You can give a description. So we'll say repo for our Django deployment example. And then I can set this private or public because I actually pay for an account here. Um, obviously I'll set it public because that's what you're going to be doing. 
And whether or not you want to initialize it for readme is up to you. We don't need one, so we won't do it. And then we can also say add git ignore, which is files that you want git to ignore in its version control. We also don't really need to worry about that, so let's just create the repository for now. Okay, so then we have the quick setup. So if you've done this kind of thing before, which I assume you haven't, uh, there's a quick way to set up this repository onto your desktop. Now there are many ways to do this, but we're going to be focusing on using the command line to do this so we can interact with this in the Atom text editor. There's a lot of other ways, including a full desktop application that comes with GitHub that's free uh, that you can use to actually visualize this process, or you can just quickly SSH or use HTTPS here. What we're going to do is use the command line at our terminal or our command prompt. But in order to do that, we actually need to download Git itself. So far, we've only set up our account on GitHub. We need to actually download Git to our computer. So the way we do that is you come to this website. And this is, if you just Google search Git, this should be one of the first things that comes up. It's git-scm.com. So that's git-scm.com. And this is where Git, the free and open source version control system, is hosted. So you can download it. What you're going to do is, depending whether you're on Windows or Mac, etc., uh, you're going to download it. So if you're on a Mac, it may, you may already have it downloaded on your computer, so make sure to check for that. The way to check is if you go to your command prompt. So for instance, here I just popped up my command prompt, uh, or if you're on your Mac, your terminal, or terminal for Linux as well. To check if you already have it, go git dash dash version, hit enter. And if you get something out, that means you actually already have uh, git installed, and you don't need to worry about this. It doesn't really matter what version. Um, really any version should work that's been downloaded in the past, I don't know, three years. Um, but let me walk through the actual download process for you, especially if you're on a Windows computer, since that can be a little confusing maybe, especially if you're a beginner. So I'm going to click download for Windows, it says download is starting, and then it's going to download that for me. So it's about 30 megabytes, I'm going to forward in time for this download to finish. And then once you've downloaded either the DMG or executable, whatever, for your format, uh, go ahead and click on it. Make sure you've downloaded the correct 32 or 64 bit. Allow it to make changes on your computer. Sorry if I went black there for a second. And then what we're going to do is say next, accept that license, go ahead and save it to Git. And then you can add some additional stuff to this. And I would just ex accept all default options. So just keep everything default. Click next and then click next again. And here's where we have three options, especially if you're on Windows. The one you need to make sure is that it actually adds it to the path. Um, so this one right here, it says use git from the Windows command prompt. It says it's adding it to your path. That's exactly what you need because if it's not added to your path, you won't be able to call it from the command line. So then you can click next. Then there's the checkout, either window style, as is, or other checkout options. You may not see this tab if you're on a Mac or Linux, so don't worry about it, but we'll just select the default again. Hit next. Again, you can hit uh, any of these. Then we'll continue. And then we can just, again, go up to defaults, and then you can hit install. So once you hit that, it'll begin installing Git onto your computer. So I'm going to forward in time until this installation is finished. So once this is done, we can just, uh, don't worry about reviewing the release notes or launching git bash, just hit finish and then go back to your command prompt, either in Atom or by itself or your terminal. So once you've completed that installation and hit finish, you can go back to your command prompt or your terminal. Sometimes you have to restart your computer in order for this to take effect, but you should be able to now type git dash dash version version, hit enter, and see the same version of whatever you just downloaded. In my case, it was version 2.12.0. Again, if you're seeing something that says um, git not recognized as a command, try restarting your computer and then entering this again. If you're still having issues, uh, go ahead and post the Q&A forums, but definitely search the Q&A forums uh, for any specific questions that you may have. It's most likely that your question's already been answered about this. All right, now that I'm here at Atom, what I'm going to do is inside Django Lectures, or wherever you so choose, I'm going to add a new folder, and this will be the folder that's going to contain a subdirectory 
of our actual Git repository. So you can call this folder whatever you want. Um, I'll call it my underscore base. It really doesn't matter what you call it, but then what you're going to do is cd into my underscore base. And this is where we're actually going to initialize our Git repository. And all the commands we're going to be running are right here on this create a new repository on the command line. You don't actually need to worry about this first command. That's just going to create a readme for you. We don't really care about that. So what we'll do instead is, and I'm going to collapse this so we see a little more room, is start with this git init. So we'll say git init, g-i-t init, hit enter. And this is going to initialize an empty git repository right at my base. And then what I'm going to do is, uh, you don't actually need to do the add. Instead, what we'll do is copy and paste one of our projects here. So open up the directory tree, and then any of the projects we've been working on is totally fine. I will copy the learning templates project from Django level four. Again, you can do anything. So we will copy this, and then I'm going to put it into my base. So we'll say paste. So now I have learning templates, and then what I'm going to do is do git add, and instead of the readme.md, because that's related to this, I'm going to say git add, and then just a period, and that basically means add everything. All right, so note that we have some couple of warnings here about line endings, things like uh, .py files. For now, you don't need to worry about these line endings. That's totally fine. So if you get a bunch of warnings like that, that's totally okay. All right, so now that we've added everything, we're going to need to commit everything. And the way you can do a commit, it's also shown right here on this git commit dash m first commit. You could, you could just copy and paste that line, but I'll uh, write it out. I'm going to say git commit, and I will say dot to commit everything that we just added, say dash m, and then a single quote, first single quote. Basically, this message right here of first can be interchanged for any message that you will want to see on GitHub. So you can say something like, oh, added learning templates project or uh, fixed issue on this file, whatever. As long as it's just uh, in quotes, it's a string, that's going to be the commit message. So we'll hit enter, and now it's going to be committed. And you should see something like, oh, it's creating a bunch of modes. That's exactly what you want. And then the next thing is to say this line, git remote add origin and then the actual URL. So I'm going to, this one I am going to just directly copy and paste it. I'm going to copy this and then right click here, paste it and then hit enter. That's all we needed to do. And then what next line is, is this one right here, git push dash u origin master. So copy that, paste it. And you can always pause the video in case you need time to write these lines down, hit enter. And this should push all the changes that we just made to GitHub. This might take a little while depending on your internet connection, and you may also be prompted to log in. So you see here, uh, I was prompted to log in. You may be prompted to log in at your actual terminal where you have to provide your email and password. I have a Windows desktop uh, server, so I can just log in here. I'm going to do that now. So I just logged in, and now it's going to do it for me. Most likely, you'll be asked to log in at the actual command prompt if uh, you don't have those settings uh, like I do. But everything should have been pushed. So we see it's writing the objects, it's sending them online. So everything should have been pushed to the actual repository. So let's come back here. We can expand this window and then click on whatever you happen to call your deployment example. But here, now I see learning templates and it was pushed by JM Portia. Right now, that's actually my a personal GitHub account, and that's my dog Frankie uh, sleeping there. But anyways, um, you should be able to see the files, and that's all we need to do for now. So it looks like, and there's their commit message first. Again, you could call that whatever you want, and we can see that the latest commit was two minutes ago. Perfect. That's all we need to do, and we are ready to go. If you have any questions on any of these steps, feel free to post to the Q&A forums. Make sure to search the Q&A forums to see if your question has been answered. Um, this is a really common place where accidentally mistyping a character or not following the instructions exactly, or maybe just uh, getting unlucky with the install can cause hiccups. Don't worry about it. I'm always here to help out, but make sure you search first because your question has probably already been asked before. All right. Thanks everybody. And I'll see you at the next lecture.
Hello everyone and welcome to the Deploying on Python Anywhere lecture. Some of the deployment process steps may take a while, especially some of the downloading of the libraries. So keep this in mind before beginning this lecture. Make sure you set aside enough time, like 20 to 30 minutes to actually run through this whole thing. And just click on the resource link to get started. It'll take you to Python Anywhere. Let's get started. Okay, here I am at Python Anywhere. And as a quick note, on another tab, I also have a link to the repository we made. And if you click here on clone or download, there's going to be a link here. That's gonna be important to us later on. So make sure you're able to have this open as well. It should be on the main page of wherever your repository is. But let's start off with Python Anywhere. What you're going to do is sign up. So if you click on pricing and sign up, right now we'll create a free beginner account. It's a very low CPU bandwidth uh, website. And it's also, you can't have your own custom domain on it. It'll be your username.pythonanywhere.com. If you end up expanding on this and wanting to work with it more, the pricing is actually pretty fair, especially if you really want to focus on Python apps. You can read all about it here. But for now, I'm just going to create a beginner account, and then you'll pass in your username, email, password, and then password again. I'm going to sign up now. Okay, so once you've signed up and logged in, make sure you uh, confirm your email if you plan to actually use this more than once. Uh, right now, I have an unconfirmed email address, so we can do that later on. But once you have this web interface, you'll notice that you have a couple of tabs. You have the consoles, files, uh, web, schedule, etc. So coming to the consoles, this basically is a consoles tab that allows you to create and interact with just Python and Bash console instances. Then the next thing over, we have files. And this allows you to upload and organize files within your disk quota. So right now, our quota is 512 megabytes. Not a whole lot, but more, more than enough for what we're going to be working with. Later on, if you decide to do a larger project, uh, you may need to pay in order to get a larger quota. Then we have a web tab, which allows you to configure settings for your hosted web applications, which we'll work with later. Then you also have a schedule tab that allows you to set up tasks to be executed at certain particular times. And also the databases tab, which allows you to configure a MySQL database uh, for your applications if they require it. Also allows you to do a Postgres if you're actually on a paid account. And out of all these tabs, we're mainly just gonna be working with the consoles tab and the web tab. Okay. The first thing we're gonna do is set up a virtual environment. Now, all you have to do is click here on bash and this will open up a bash console for you. It should look something like this. It'll say loading console, loading bash interpreter. And then right here we have the actual console. And I'm going to zoom in a lot so you can see what I'm typing. Okay. And what we're going to do is make a virtual environment. So we'll say this, mk virtual env. So previously we had used conda create on our own computer to create a virtual environment. Uh, Python Anywhere doesn't have the Anaconda distribution of Python, but what it does have is this virtual env, which is going to work pretty much the exact same way. So then what we're going to do is say dash dash Python is equal to, and then we will call this, or we'll type in Python, and we'll say 3.5 because that's the latest version of Python that's available on pythonanywhere.com. Maybe by the time you're viewing this, Python 3.6 is going to be available. It's Python 3.6 is already released. I'm not sure if it's already available on Python Anywhere, but our application will work with 3.5 or 3.6 either way. And then the actual name of our project. So we'll call it my P R O J, and that's the name of your project's virtual environment. So basically what this is saying is create a virtual environment or make a virtual environment where Python is equal to the version Python 3.5 and call it my P R O J. So we'll hit enter. It's going to run this and install all the setup tools and everything we need. So again, this may take a little while depending on the internet connection that we're using. So uh, be patient and I'm going to fast forward in time while this finishes installing everything. Okay, so it's finished installing. That took maybe uh, about 30 seconds for me. That should also not take you a whole lot of time for you. Then notice here, I have in parentheses my PROJ. That means my virtual environment is activated just like when we were using Conda Create. So then what I can do is check out what packages are already installed and I can just say pip list, hit enter, and that's going to list all the packages that are already installed here. 
So I have app DIRs, packaging, pip, pipe parsing, setup tools, six, wheel. These are all very basic uh, uh, packages and tools that essentially just help you install other packages and tools. But what we need is Django. So we're gonna say this, we'll say pip install, and we're gonna say dash capital U space Django equal to, and then whatever version of Django you happen to have been using for your project. The way to find out what version of Django you were using on your project is actually really easy. What you're gonna do is on your own computer, open up the command prompt or terminal. So I'm gonna bring that in. So this one's from my own computer. This is the command prompt on my Windows machine. Open up your terminal on your Linux or Mac. And then what you're going to do is with your virtual environment activated, or if you weren't using one, that's also okay. Type in Python. And then you're going to import Django and then you're just going to type Django dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore hit enter and it should report back the version you were using and in my case it was 1.10.5 so we will minimize that and then I will say Django is equal to 1.10.5 hit enter and that's going to pip install that specific version of Django and I'm really zoomed in here so I got kind of some weird looking output so I will I'll zoom out a little bit, but essentially you should see something that looks like this. Um, it's going to install a bunch of stuff and it's going to kind of show the loading process. All right, so this may take a little bit of time, so keep that in mind. I'm going to fast forward in time. It looks like it's now just installing the collected packages. So everything's been downloaded and it's going to install. Again, this takes a little bit of time. Uh, feel free to go get a coffee right now and I will fast forward in time and meet you back here. Okay, so Django has finished installing for me. I'm going to zoom back in here so we can see my command line a little better. In order to confirm that Django has been installed, what you can easily do is pass in the Django admin command line tool. So what we can do is say, which Django-admin.py, hit enter. And if you get something that looks like this back, dot virtual environments, my project bin djangoadmin.py. That's exactly what you're looking for. It's basically telling you that when it runs django-admin, it's going to grab it from the virtual environment in my project, which is exactly what we want. So that means we successfully installed this. If your particular Django uh, project depends on other applications of uh, Python, you'll need to install those as well. Our applications so far have been simple enough where we just need to install Django. But let's say you depend on other libraries like plotting libraries or data analysis libraries, machine learning libraries, those will be need to installed here. So that would be another pip install step. Okay, so now it's time to actually get a copy of our Git repository onto uh, our hosted Python Anywhere. So this is where you're going to come over here and then where it says clone or download, you are going to copy this. So whatever this link is, you're going to copy it to the clipboard. It'll say copied, come back here and then you can type git clone and then right click or control V to paste it in. There it goes. And then we're gonna hit enter and it's going to clone it there. It sometimes may ask you for your password or username depending whether it's public or private. So keep that in mind. Since ours is totally public, it cloned it no problem. And we'll be talking about uh, security things later on. I'm showing you a very open, loose way of doing things right now just to get the general ideas down. Uh, we definitely don't want to do this for a more realistic project. Uh, we've left our security key open and it's publicly available for viewing. Definitely don't want to do that, but the general process is going to be really similar. All right, so I've cleared my console. I had a lot of stuff in there. And since this con console is basically on a Linux machine, uh, what you have to do is type in, whoops, clear to clear a console. Okay. So let's type ls to list everything. We have readme.txt and then Django deployment example. I'm going to cd into Django deployment example. Just click tab to autocomplete that. And then type in ls. That will list everything. Looks like we have learning templates. So I'm going to cd into learning templates. And then I'm at Django deployment example, learning templates list. And I have my basic app that SQLite learning templates, manage.py templates. Okay. So typically you're gonna have models that you need to actually migrate and set up. So this is the step in which you would do that. You would say Python manage.py 
migrate, hit enter, make all the general migrations you have to do. In our case, we didn't really have anything besides the admin operations. We had no actual models in our applications. If you do, you'd see a lot more here. And then the other thing you'd have to do is just like we did locally, is say Python, make migrations, and then the name of your applications that you needed to make those migrations to, such as in our case, basic underscore app. Again, we don't have any models here, so we shouldn't see anything uh, here. Um, whoops, I forgot to say Python, manage.py, make migrations, basic underscore app. There we go. So again, no changes detected in app, basic app. Uh, if you do have models there, you will detect those changes. And then again, you have to repeat Python, manage.py, migrate. Okay, so again, no migrations to apply. But those are the kind of steps. We've done them all before locally. You'd have to do them again here. All right, so something else we wanna make sure we do is when we're working with the admin interface, we probably need a super user. So we'll have to say Python, manage.py, create super user, hit enter, and then just create a super user. I'll use the same uh, person I've been using all the time. Uh, let's actually give this training. Uh, here in data.com, enter, and then the password. The password won't show up. And then pass it in again. Um, and then your super user will be created uh, successfully. Okay, so the database is set up, all your migrations are done, you've created a super user, you've marked down the password somewhere, and you are ready to actually set up your web application, and that involves setting up the actual WSGI uh, settings. And this basically just uh, involves telling Python Anywhere to actually serve your application if someone visits your page. So what we're going to be doing is zooming out of this again, and here we're going to go back to our dashboard. So click on your dashboard, come back to it, and then click on the web tab, and then say add a new web app. A pop-up a pop-up box is going to appear, and then you're basically going to follow the instructions here. If you want your own custom domain name, you're going to have to pay for that. So right now I'm just at pyreandatapractice.pythonanywhere.com. Um, I'm going to take this down, so probably by the time you're actually viewing this, you're not going to be able to see my example website. So I'll click next. Then we'll say select a Python web framework. So we'll select Django, since that's what we're using. And then we're using Django 1.10 with Python 3.5. So we'll hit that as well. And then there's a quick start new Django project. It says this will create a brand new Django app. If you already have an app you wanna use, use the manual config instead. Which means we actually need to go back and what we're gonna do is hit manual configuration on this. And then we're gonna select Python version and then the manual configuration involves editing this WSGI file, this configuration file. So what we're going to do is when we click next, they're going to create one for you. It's just a simple Hello World app. And then we're going to change it to actually point to ours. So we'll say next. It's going to create that for us. And then what you can do now is copy this. So we can open this link in a new tab. And you shouldn't see your actual website. Instead, you'll just see something that says Hello World. So it says, hello world, this is the default welcome page for a Python Anywhere app. To figure out more, uh, click on web app setup page. So you can actually click on this page and it has a list of instructions that we're going to be following. So it says everything that we need to do here. So on this web uh, tab page, you're going to scroll down until you see virtual ENV. So what we're going to do is enter a path to the virtual ENV. So let's do that now. We will click here, enter path and it's going to be uh, home, well, slash home, slash your username. In my case, it's Pyrian or Pyrian Data, I believe training, Pyrian Data Practice, that's what I called it. You can view it actually up here on the actual URL. So it says user Pyrian Data Practice, slash, and then we'll say dot virtual ENVS, slash, and then whatever hap you happen to have named your virtual environment. In my case, it was just my PROJ. So we'll come here and say dot virtually NVS and say my PROJ. Then we'll hit the check mark and it's going to line up. Perfect. And as long as you did this all correctly, you should be able to start a console. So what we're going to do next is actually set up the source code for this. 
So you come back up here to the code section and then what we're going to end up doing is setting up the code. So we'll do this. So we need to set up the link to the actual uh, project folder. Now I've actually kind of uh, forgotten, so I'll show you how to get it again. Just start a console in this virtual ENV. It's going to bring you back to the bash console. It'll do the execute environment, take us back there, and let me actually grab the virtual, excuse me, the file path to our actual project. So I can zoom in here. So this is what you can do in case you forgot it, like I just did. Um, hit LS. All right, so there's the Django deployment example. So I'm going to CD into Django deployment example, LS again, and I'm going to CD into learning templates. And then I'm going to type PWD. That's going to print my working directory. Let me zoom out a little bit. So this actually prints out nicely. So PWD, and here it is, so it's home. Uh, whatever your username is, whatever you happen to name that folder, and then the name of your actual project. So I will copy this, and this is what I'm going to be using. So we will come back to our dashboard, and then paste that into the source code. So again, come to the web tab, then come down to code, it says enter the path here, and we are going to enter that path. So let's make sure it starts with slash home. Yep, yeah, looks like it's good to go, so hit the check mark. And that should now show us that it's matched the source code for our actual project. And now one of the very last things we have to do is just set up our WSGI configuration file. So click on that and it will take you to a place where you can actually end up editing that file. And you have this nice little editor in here. And this is what's really great about Python Anywhere. Um, I really enjoy it because it's really meant for uh, people who love and use Python a lot. If you're using another language, um, don't use this site. <laughs> Obviously it's called Python Anywhere for a reason. Okay, so let's get to editing this. I'm going to zoom in so we can see it a little better. There we go. So the very first thing they show you is the hello world. That's what it was displaying before. And what we're going to do is just delete all of this. So this little line of code, basically from line, I guess around 13 to 47, this was just the hello world page. So we're gonna delete all of that because we don't need it anymore we're gonna be telling it to go to our page. And what's nice about Python Anywhere is they actually kind of set it already up for you. So what we can do here is scroll down to where it says Django and then start uncommenting some of these lines. So we're gonna say import OS, import sys for system, and then we're going to set up the path. And again, that's just going to be uncommenting these three lines. So path, if, etc. So it says right now, home, your username, my site. We're going to need to change that to actually point to your project. So my project is not called my site. It's underneath this Django deployment example. So the name of that repository and then the name of the project itself. Okay, so that's what I need. And then you can keep this here, this if path, not in syspath, syspath.append path. That's totally okay. And then from here on, what we're going to do is do a couple more edits. And what we need to do is change to our project directory. So out here we'll say os.chdir, so change directory. And we'll pass in the path variable that we just defined as our path to our project. So again, all I'm saying right now so far is import os, import sys, path, set it equal to learning templates, if path on a syspath, syspath on a pen path, that's okay as well. os.change directory to the path we just created. And then I need to tell Django where the settings.py module is located. So one way to do that is through something that looks like this. Another way to do that, which is kind of a little more in line with what we did locally, is say os.environ set default default and then pass in in all caps Django underscore settings underscore module comma and then the actual path to your settings. So, well, not the path, just the actual settings folder. So that'll be learning underscore templates dot settings. So that's kind of where the settings.py file is. And then what we're going to do is say import Django, Django dot setup. And in fact, a lot of this code is actually up here already. So if you kind of scroll up, it'll say custom WSGI. Uh, some of this code that we're gonna be using is up here. So that's okay. Uh, we can just get some practice writing it in ourselves. 
So what we do is just, uh, since we're using a version of Django that's greater than 1.5, just say from Django.core, this guy. And then we're going to save this. Let it save. Then we will come back and actually check to make sure we have uh, no gateway errors. So let's go back to the actual dashboard. And then where it says web, I'm going to click on this link. And here it says, welcome to index. Hello, click on other, takes us to the other page and click on brand, takes us back to the home page. And now you'll notice if I click on admin, I get this sort of weird Django administration. It doesn't look as nice as it usually looked for us. That means we actually need to go back to the web tab and tell where to look for the static files. So here I can fill stuff out, hit log in, and you'll notice that it still looks ugly. So let's go back to the web tab and fix this. Okay, so coming back to the web tab, we have the web tab open here, and we're gonna scroll all the way down until you see the static file. Okay, so here we see static files, and this is where we're going to be linking files that aren't dynamically generated by our code, like CSS and JavaScript. And there's basically two main static files that we need to link to. One are the static files for the admin page, and then the second one are your own static admin files. Now this particular project, I don't believe actually had any static admin files, so we'll create the link, and then we'll also show you how you can create new files and edit those to actually add in the static. But first, we'll show you the one that you're always gonna have, which is the static for the admin. So the URL that this goes under here is static slash admin. Put that in, and then we're gonna enter the path. And this is kind of a long, complicated path. It's home slash your username for the website. So in this case, it's, uh, well, your username for uh, pythonanywhere.com, let me be clear on that. Appearing data practice, slash, and then the dot virtual ENVS, slash the name of your virtual environment that you created. So in my case, it was my proj, slash lib, slash, and then you pass in the Python version you were using. So it's Python 3.5 for us. Yours may be Python 3.6 by the time you're watching this. And then we say slash site dash packages slash Django slash contrib slash admin slash static slash admin. All right, kind of a really long path, so go ahead and pause the screen if you need to copy and paste this. Um, and then the next one we're gonna do is actually set up our own static file. So we'll keep this static admin and directory as it is right now, and we'll come back in a little bit and fix this URL and directory for our own static paths. But after you ever edit something here, you need to reload your web app, which means come all the way up to the top and click here on reload the web app. And then there's another thing we're gonna have to do, which is turn off debug mode and also make sure that we've allowed uh, our pythonanywhere.com to be an actual host. Because if you click this right now, you'll get an error. So you should get something like this allowed host. So if you click here, you'll get something like this. And it says, make sure that period data practice.pythonanywhere.com is to allowed host. So in order to fix that, we'll come back here and we're gonna come to files. We'll come to files. We'll hit on Django deployment example, go to learning templates. And then learning templates is the name of the project itself. And then here we can see the settings.py file click on that because that's what we're going to be editing. And what's nice, Python Anywhere has this nice uh, Python editor for you to play around with. So here we see everything that we usually saw. And what we need to do is say under allowed hosts, pass in a string that is your username, your Python Anywhere username that is. Whoops, let me make sure I spelled that right. Practice slash, or excuse me, dot pythonanywhere.com basically whatever is hosting it. So save that. So we can save that and then let's come back to learning templates. And here we can either create a new directory or a new file. So under learning templates, call this outside one. So here we see basic app, learning templates, templates. I'm going to create a new directory name and we'll call it static hit new directory, and there's nothing in there right now. So this is where you can upload static files later on. 
So we've already gone over how to do static stuff, but let's actually set up the link to it. So it's under learning templates, static. Remember, it always goes there on the same level as the applications in the project. And now we're gonna come back to web and show you how we can add that. Okay, so once we made those changes back at the web tab, we're going to reload the actual site, make sure those settings went through, and then click again on configuration, open that in a new tab. And we should see now, welcome to index, hello. And if you click on admin, it will look like the normal nice admin. So it means your static files were actually linked together. Now what happens if you go to somewhere that is not on your website. So let's say you go to your URL name and then pass in some random numbers, hit enter. Notice that we are still in debug mode. Um, and you're seeing this error because debug is equal to true. If you change that to false, Django will display a standard 404 page. So let's actually make sure that happens. We don't want debug. It reveals a lot of stuff about our actual code. So we'll come back here, exit this out, exit back the old disallowed, come back to files, and then come back to Django deployment example, learning templates, and then come back to our learning templates project. That has our settings.py file. Click on it. And then here where it says debug, we'll set it to be equal to false. We will save this, and then we're gonna come back to learning templates, and then come back to web. And then I'm also going to now set up the link to the other static files. So there is no other static files right now, but maybe you have static files for your project, so let's show you how to actually do this. So what you're gonna end up doing is the following. You will set the URL to just be slash static as it suggests, hit enter, and then we pass in the file path to our actual static file. So in our case, if we go back, it's under home, pre and data practice, slash, and then let's make sure we actually find that file. In order to do that, I'm going to double check and scroll back up and open our files tab in a new tab so I can check on it. Okay, Django deployment example, learning templates, static. Okay, so it's under Django deployment example. So let's scroll down here, pass that back in. So slash Django dash deployment dash example slash, and let's click on it again, learning underscore templates, perfect. So all the way to the right learning underscore templates slash static. And then now this is linked to the static CSS files. We don't have any on our particular example, but this is what you would do for your own examples. Okay, so let's try this again. Make sure we reload these changes. Take time to reload. And then we're going to open up our file again, our actual website. Great, and now it's working and everything's linked. So if I come to the admin, it's linked to the admin static files. And if I had my own static files, those would also be linked. And now you'll also notice that if I say slash something that doesn't belong, I get a not found 404 page. Now you can eventually put in your own 404 pages and we'll see uh, this all again when we talk about clones later on. All right, so this was a super long lecture video. I know um, it's kind of hard to separate out the steps because it's kind of all one long flowing process but hopefully you saw that Python Anywhere has a lot of built-in stuff that's ready to help you out. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to post them to the Q&A forums, but definitely make sure that you followed all the steps. Even if you mess one of them up, everything further than that can be messed up as well. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to an advanced Django section. In this section, we'll be discussing class-based views. So this is your first advanced Django section, and basically what these advanced Django sections do is they take deeper dives into certain topics of Django. And in this particular section, we're going to be discussing class-based views, or CVVs. Previously, we've created views using functions in our views.py file. However, Django provides really powerful tools to use object-oriented programming, or OOP, and Python classes to define views in your views.py file. The class-based view method offers great functionality, and for most experienced users of Django, it's actually their default choice for creating views. So while I am calling this an advanced topic, if you go out into the real world, most experienced users of Django actually use class-based views as their default method. 
So if you ever look on GitHub for other Django projects, you're most likely to experience class-based views instead of function-based views. Now it's much easier to understand class-based views after working with function views, which is why I'm calling this an advanced topic. Okay, we're going to start off with a simple example of a Hello World class-based view, and then slowly build up to more complex examples, and then talking about something called mixins. Okay, hope you're excited. Let's get started. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to this Hello World class-based view lecture. What we're going to be doing in this lecture is just converting a simple Hello World function view into a class-based view to get to the idea of how they relate to each other. What we're also going to be doing is using the simplest available Django view class. Later on, we'll learn about more complex classes, but right now we'll keep it basic. And essentially what we're going to be doing in our views.py file is importing this view object, which is going to come from django.views.generic. We will also have to slightly change the way we call a class-based view in the urls.py file of our project. What we need to do is add in a dot as underscore view method call off of the class. And this is an inherited method from the view that we mentioned earlier. If that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you right now, don't worry, it will all be very clear when we actually program this all out. Let's hop over to the editor, start a project, and get started. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor, and as you can see here, I've already activated my virtual environment. So you can go ahead and do that. You don't have to do it if you already have the 1.10 version of Django in your normal environment. What we're going to do is create a new folder, say new folder, and I'm going to call this um, advanced underscore section. Doesn't really matter what you call it. Then I'm going to say CD into that advanced section, and here's where I'm going to call the Django admin. I will say Django-admin, and let's start a project. You can call this project whatever you want. I'll call it something simple like ADV CBV, so Advanced Class Space Views. Hit enter and let that start the project, and then we'll also create a simple application. Eventually what we're going to be doing with this project in later lectures of this section is creating models that kind of show a student within a class, or a school I should say. Okay. So we have the advanced section. Let's CD into ADV CBV. And then what we're going to do now is, if I actually expand this window, I should be able to see it. So here I am in my project folder. Let's say Django-admin, and let's say start app. And I'm gonna call this basic underscore app. You can really call it whatever you want. We're just going to be using uh, one simple application for this project. Okay. So I have my basic app and I have my advanced CBV project. What I'm going to do is come over to settings, open that up and make sure that everything's linked as it should be. Later on, we'll also be creating uh, templates in this. So we'll show you different ways of doing that, things that we haven't seen before. But if I scroll down to install apps, I want to add in my basic underscore app there. Put a comma in case I install any more apps and then let's save that, perfect. And then while we're here, we're actually going to add in the templates as well. Like I mentioned later on, we're going to show you a slightly different way of ordering your templates. Um, right now, we'll keep it the same as we've been doing. I will say template underscore dir is equal to os.path.join. And I'm going to join that base directory with templates. And remember, we have to create templates. And then coming all the way down to where it says templates, the directory I want to pass in here is template underscore dir. So nothing new we haven't seen before. And at the same level as my project and my application, I will click create a new folder and I will call it templates to match up that directory that I just linked to. Perfect. And then what I will also do is inside of this templates folder is create a new file and we will call this index.html. This is going to be our home page. That's the first thing we're going to be showing. And let's kind of practice using uh, template inheritance. So I'll create another file and we'll call this base.html. So in the base.html, let's set up these two HTML files. And then what we're going to do is later on show you uh, the class-based views, what we actually want to talk about. But to actually show a view, we need something to show the index.html page and the base.html page. And we're going to be playing with these files later on in future lectures of the section. So Let's just give them a nice title, we'll say, let's we'll call this base so that it's apparent uh, what we're doing here. And then inside this body, 
let's say, let's create the block. And we'll call it block. We'll call it body block. And then we're going to, outside of this, call end block. And remember, since I'm going to extend this in other files, essentially anything outside of this is also going to be called. So something that will be convenient to call is bootstrap. And instead of uh, copying and pasting all the files, I'm just going to copy and paste the link. So as always, you can just grab this at getbootstrap.com. Um, version three is what I'm using here. You should be able to use version four as well, if no problems. And what I'm going to do is also put everything inside a container class. So we'll say div container, Obviously on your own websites, you'll you know have to judge whether putting everything in a container like this is a good idea. But for what we're doing, it kind of makes sense. So I will save this. And then in my index page, what I'm going to do is extend from that base.html that I just made. So we will say extends and then pass in quotes base.html, that file. And then we're going to call the body block. We'll call, whoops, block first. If I can spell this right and then body underscore block, and then we will call end block. And finally, the actual content we want. In this case, let's just put something like, hello world, index page, home. Something really obvious that we're at the index.html homepage. Perfect. Now let's get to kind of the whole point of this lecture, the views.py file and the urls.py file. We'll start off just by creating a basic function view, and then we'll translate that into a class-based view. So underneath my basic app, I'll hit on views.py. Right now there's no views in it, so let's actually create one. We'll start off with the original function type view we've been using, which is def index request, and then return, render, pass in request, and let's just pass in that index.html page and save that. And then we'll come over to our project urls.py file. We won't create a urls.py file for our function folder yet, or excuse me, our application folder yet. So here in the project urls.py file, so advcbv urls.py, come down here and let's add in the pattern. I'll say from the basic app or whatever you happen to call your application, import views, and then here I will call URL and let's just set it up for the home page. So for that, it's just the domain page itself. So indexing or regular expression wise, just that uh, caret symbol dollar sign. And then we'll call views dot. And the only function in there is the index, which is exactly what we want. Let's save that. So I'm going to come back down to my terminal. And before I run the server, I want to make sure I make my migrations. I'll call Python manage.py and say migrate, hit enter. Should see uh, some stuff coming on the screen, just a little bit. You can see here that some uh, SQLite databases are being created, which is exactly what we want. That's working just fine. And then once that is complete, I always like to say Python manage.py, and we'll call make migrations on our application, which in this case is basic underscore app. And we haven't actually added any models or anything, so it'll say no changes detected. Uh, I'm a little always paranoid about that, so I just do it anyways. And then like I mentioned, I'm always a little paranoid, so then I just say migrate again, make sure everything is right. So once we see no migrations to apply, we should be ready to go. So let's see if we actually uh, can make this work. So I will say python manage.py, and I'm going to ask it to run the server. And hopefully we see that URL pop up. There it is. Let's copy and paste this and make sure that our home page is working. And then bringing in my browser over here, it says hello world index page home. It's in a nice container, looks good, perfect. So we know our function base view is working. Now let's kind of turn it into a class-based view, which is actually pretty simple. Let me show you what we can do. I'll come back to my views.py file. Okay, so back here at the views.py file, I have this index view function. What I'm going to do is replace this with a class-based view. And I will say from Django.views.generic import and the most basic view class you can call whoops is just view so capital v view and then i'm going to delete all of this and instead of actually calling the index.html file what i'm going to do is just give a very basic http response not something you'll be doing often but i want to show you the most basic class-based view you can possibly do 
So here we're calling class. This is object-oriented programming. So if this is confusing to you, review those lectures. And then I'm going to inherit from view. And here I'm going to say def get self, because it's a method inside this class. And then I will take in the request. And then what I'm going to do is return an HTTP response. So in order to do that, I will say from django.http import HTTP response. So when we're dealing with uh, class-based views lectures later on in this course, we actually won't be doing this. We'll be doing something that's actually much simpler, but I kind of want to show you uh, the greedier way or the more manual way of doing this. So we'll say return HTTP response and then we'll say class-based views are cool, exclamation. So then what is actually happening here? Well, when your urls.py file calls views.index, we actually need to change that. Instead of calling views.index, since that function is no longer here, we need to call the cbview class. Let's do that. So in here, I'm going to delete this line where it says views.index. And I'm still importing views from my basic app. But what I need to do is add in views dot and then CB view, which was the name of that class we just did. And the other thing I have to do is as underscore view close parentheses. And then let's have another set of parentheses to close off this URL function. And this is the main method that you're going to see in the urls.py file. As we learn about other ways of creating class-based views, essentially in the urls.py file, this isn't going to change. You'll always say views dot, the name of your class-based view, and then you'll say dot as view close parentheses. And this basically tells Django, okay, grab that class and then show it as a view. So coming back here, it's going to grab this, and then what it's going to call is it'll say get, grab that request, and just return this response. Class-based views are cool. Notice that we're actually not even returning a template. We'll show how to do that in the next lecture, but this is the most basic class-based view you can possibly get. So let's save all our changes here. Big things to note is that we're using a class-based view and we're calling this views, the class name dot as view. That's essentially the main thing I want you to get out of this lecture before we head on to the next one. We'll say Python, manage.py, run our server, hit enter. Let's bring in that browser. And I'm going to bring that in, and here it is. Class-based views are cool. This is just the most basic HTTP response. We usually won't be doing something like this, but now you know how to make a very basic class-based views. Now you might be thinking, well, it's not so great. In fact, uh, class-based views look a little more complicated to me than that older function-based view. Well, that's because we haven't talked about generic template-based views, and those are going to be an awesome tool that is going to save you so much time. And it's kind of the main reason that people eventually don't use function-based views at all, and they use class-based views for everything. So if this doesn't convince you yet, don't worry. I think the next lecture will really convince you to switch everything over to class-based views, which is essentially what we're going to be doing for the rest of the course and those clone projects. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture where we discuss those template views. Hello everyone and welcome to the template views lecture for the class based views section of the course. It's now time to learn how to use the template view object that comes with Django. Previously we just called in the basic view object from those generic views. Now we're going to learn how to use the template view and it's really going to make calling templates a breeze. Very easy. Now let's see a comparison between using a function to call a template as we have in the past versus using the template view object. So previously, for a function-based view that called some sort of template, you had to say the DEF name of that view function passed in the request, and then somewhere along the line, you returned a render of that request plus the actual template you wanted to return. For a class-based template view, it's also really easy, and I would argue even easier than that function. You just create the class, call it whatever you want. In this case, we'll just call it index view, and you inherit the template view object after importing it, and then you just set the class object attribute template underscore name equal to whatever the template you want to return, in this case, index.html. Okay, let's show the basics of this and also show you how you can use a template class-based view along with a context dictionary. I'll hop over to the editor and get started. Okay, back at our editor, let's start by opening up views.py in our application. So far we showed that very basic class-based view with a simple HTTP response, but usually you're going to want to return the templates themselves. So we can delete all that, 
and we can also delete the HTTP response, so we won't be using it. And instead of just importing view, what we're going to import is template view. We can do that from django.views.generic. So this is still known as a generic view. And we'll start off with creating the class. And we'll call it index view. And we will inherit the template view instead of just the normal view from before. And then all we have to do to match something up is you say the template underscore name class object attribute. And then you just pass in the actual template you want. So for instance, right now under my templates folder, I have index.html, but maybe if you had it under templates and then your application, so it would look something like basic underscore app slash index.html, et cetera. Right now, since I just have it under index, or excuse me, under templates, I don't actually have a subdirectory there. We'll just call index.html and I'm going to save this and that's it. That's all we have to do in the views.py file. And then coming back to our urls.py file, you just scroll down here, and instead of saying CB view, I will call that index view. And remember, we always have to call it as view. So let's save that as well. And just to make sure this is working, I will call index.html and say something like uh, testing template view. Save that. And now let's actually run the server. I'm going to CD into the advanced section, CD into ADV. CBV, and now I'll call python manage.py and run my server. Hit enter, and let's actually make sure that's running. Okay, looks like it's operating. We'll copy and paste this into our browser and bring over our browser. Okay, bring it in the browser. Perfect. We get testing template view, and it's all working correctly. So now what you probably want to know is how do we actually use a context dictionary? A big part of using templates is injecting content into the actual template. So let's walk through how to do that. Later on, we're also going to be discussing things like detailed views, list views, which actually help you a lot. But this is the most basic way to do it with a template view. I'll do control C to stop running that server. And in here, let's say H2, and we'll put in injected content. And here I'll have something like inject me, which will be the key for our context dictionary that we're going to be working with in just a little bit. So my plan is inject something into this index.html page. So I'll come back to views.py. And the way to do this is pretty particular, but it's actually not so bad. You create a method called get underscore context underscore data. And since this is a method in OOP, you pass in self, and then you pass in quargs. So you pass in asterisk, asterisk, K-W-A-R-G-S. And let me take a brief moment to actually explain this sort of syntax that we haven't seen before. Two asterisk signs and then quargs. And you may have also seen something that's just one asterisk sign and args. So in Python, basically what's going on here is the actual syntax is just one asterisk or two asterisks. Whatever you pass after that, doesn't really matter, it can be your choice. But by convention, you always see two asterisks with quargs for keyword arguments, or one asterisk with just arguments. So let's talk about what this actually means, this keyword arguments. And I'm gonna do that by kind of opening up a Stack Overflow link. Let's hop to that now. All right, so I'm at the Stack Overflow link where someone basically answered the question, what do this single asterisk and double asterisk mean? And let's start off with the single asterisk, even though we won't be using it right now. But basically what this does is it gives you all the function parameters as a giant tuple. So if you have one star, one asterisk with args inside of a function call, so here you see a very basic function, foo, and it accepts args. Basically what happens is for a and args, you can do something. So it passes this all in as a tuple. And you might be thinking, well, why do you need that? Well, sometimes for a function, you don't want to have a set number of inputs. You want to be able to take as many inputs as necessary. And in that case, you can use args. So here we pass in one, it just prints out one. If we pass in one, two, three, foo doesn't care. Since you said args, it'll just say print out one, print out two, print out three. It's basically a way that you can prepare the function to accept more than one argument. And it passes that all in as a tuple. And then the keyword argument, or using double asterisk sign, gives you corresponding dictionaries. So it's just kind of an advanced method, or not necessarily advanced, but kind of building on top of that concept. 
So we have keyword arguments, and that's denoted by two asterisk sign. And here we can see a very simple function. It's just called bar, and the input it accepts is two asterisk, two stars, two asterisk signs, and keyword args, k w args. And then it says for a in the keyword arguments, print a, and then like a dictionary call, print the actual value for that key at a. And basically what this allows you to do is have the user define uh, parameters as they go along. So here they can say, okay, name is gonna be equal to one, age is equal to 27. Now, when you were creating that function, you never said there's going to be a name parameter or an age parameter. What this keyword argument allows us to do is actually have the user define those. And then essentially what we get back when we use keyword arguments is a dictionary where you can print out A, the key they gave, in this case, it's age, and the keyword argument, which is 27. Now, remember that dictionaries don't retain any order, which is why you see it printed out in some random order, in age 27 and name one. Okay. You can check out a stack, another Stack Overflow page, just Google search what is quarks or what is args in case that doesn't make sense to you. But essentially what it's allowing us to do is take keyword arguments and treat them as a dictionary. So I'm going to bring this aside now and let's continue back with using quarks. And what we will do here is call context equal to, and we're gonna use the super function that's built into Python. And then we'll say get context data and then pass in keyword arguments. And if you're kind of having trouble with just understanding what's actually going on here, you don't actually need to know it um, on a deeper level. You essentially just need to do copy and paste this line because the work you're gonna be doing happens on this next line, which is the typical context dictionary that we've seen before. You pass in the key, inject me, which matches what we wrote on the index.html page, and then whatever you want to inject. So either a list or an item, Later on, we'll see how to grab stuff from our model, but we'll just call this basic injection. And then we just return that context dictionary. And that's how you can use a context dictionary with a template view. And like I mentioned, with list views and detail views that we'll learn about in the next lecture, you will have to worry about this even less. I'm just showing you the very basic way of doing it with a template view. So don't worry too much if this particular line eight or keyword arguments doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. Later on, we'll see much easier ways of dealing with this. I'm going to save views.py and notice here I called context inject me. And if I go over to index.html, I have this inject me key. So I should see when I actually run the server again, this injected content and it'll say basic injection in all caps. So let's call python manage.py, run the server and then bring in our browser again. And here it is. We see testing template view, injected content and then basic injection in all caps. Great. And those are the very basics of returning a template with a context dictionary. And that's really all you need to know. Usually, however, you're going to be dealing with a combination of models and forms, and you'll want to either list out every object in that model or list out a particular object with all its details. And what we're going to be learning about in the next lecture is another generic view, probably the two most common ones, which is a list view and a detail view. And they're going to be building off this idea of the template view, essentially setting some sort of convenient class object attribute, and then just being able to call convenient methods off of that to create very easy views. And detail view and list view are gonna make your life a lot easier. But to see them, what we have to do is create models, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, and then link them up to those views. Okay. Hopefully by now you have a very basic understanding of the power of class-based views. And in the next lecture, we'll show you more of their convenience features. Thanks, I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to List Views and Detail Views. We've learned how to use class-based views to directly show a template. But what about models in your application? Often when you have models, we want to either list the records from the model or show details of a single record in that model's database. And previously we did this with calls using that object relation mapper directly. And that was back when we were doing things such as calling mymodel.objects.all. That's how we used to connect a template to an actual call to the model to show information from the database. However, you can imagine that these sort of operations are very common. And they're so common that Django has some generic view classes you can inherit from to actually very quickly display information from your model. And this is where the power of class-based views really comes to help us out. So if you haven't been convinced yet that class-based views are worth the tiny bit of extra effort, 
Um, after this lecture, I really think your opinion is going to change and you'll probably never want to go back to function-based views. Okay, so in this lecture, what we're going to be doing is quickly creating some new models to actually show off these features, as well as some new templates. And then we're gonna focus on two generic views, which is the list view and the detail view. So far, we've only seen view and template view. Now we're gonna learn about list view and detail view, which will allow us to connect to the models, which we're going to be creating also in this lecture. And then previously, we've been putting all our templates inside the templates folder within the matching app folder. And what we're also going to do in this lecture is show you the common practice, which is essentially the reverse. Have a template folder inside of the applications folder. So to say it another way, previously we had that templates folder, and then inside of that you had your matching application folder, and then inside of that you had those .html files. It's really common in the real world to have it essentially the reverse way. So under your application folder, that has its own templates folder, and under that you have your HTML files. So we're gonna show an example of doing that in this lecture as well. And this is gonna basically set you up to be able to read other real world projects. So if you're ever browsing GitHub and see someone's Django project, most likely they'll be using class-based views, especially list and detail view, and they'll have the template structure that we're gonna show in this lecture. Okay, so there's a lot to cover. Let's get started by hopping over to the Atom text editor. All right, so the first thing to actually show a list view and a detail view is to create the models that they're gonna report back. So let's come over to models.py in our basic app folder, and let's create those models. I'm gonna to try to mimic some sort of school administration website. So maybe we'll have a class, school, and that will say models.model, and then we're gonna have three fields. We'll have a name of the school, and that will be models, and that will be a character field. And we can give it a max length if we want. Let's just say 256, doesn't really matter for our case. And then every school also has a principal of that school. And we'll say models dot a character field. And what the heck, let's also give it a max length for that principal's name. And then every school is also going to have a location. So models dot, that's also a character field. Uh, we'll give it a max length, 256 as well. And then if we remember from talking about models, we usually want to have a string representation of that model in case we ever want to print it out. So we'll create that special method, str, and I will say return self.name. All right, looking good on that school. And schools have students, so let's create another model. We'll call it class student. Let me make a couple new lines here so we can see this all typed out. And then I'll inherit from models.model. And let's give these students three fields. So the student themselves are gonna have a name. We won't worry about last name or first name, just keep things simple right now. And let's give these students name a max length of 256 as well. I'm choosing that number arbitrarily. All right, and another attribute a student can have is an age. And what we're going to do is call models and something we haven't seen before as a field is the positive integer field. Uh, let me make sure I spell that right, integer field. And we won't provide any more arguments there because basically what the positive integer field, as you may have guessed, just is a positive integer. Makes sense because ages can't be negative. And since these are essentially, we'll call them elementary school kids, we don't care if they're 11.5 years old. We'll just say they're either 11, 12, etc. And each student is going to be assigned a school. And that will be then a foreign key field because we want it to match up to the school object up here or the school model, I should say, which means we pass in school and we can also pass in a uh, related name parameter that will allow us to call this later on. So we'll say related name is students and let's have a string. So if you ever print out a student, we'll probably just return that student's name, self.name. Okay, pretty simple stuff here. You have the school model, it has a name, a principal, a location, and then we have name, age, and school for the student, and that's basically it. And what we wanna do is register these in our admin.py file. So let's open up admin.py under basic app, and I will import from basicapp.models, import school, comma, student. And then I will call admin.site.register. 
in its lowercase, and we'll pass in school, and we're going to do the same thing for student. So admin.site.register student. That way I can just quickly call the admin and add some students and add some schools. You can also create a population.py file to auto-populate this using Faker, but things are just simple right now. Let's focus on the class-based views. So I'll just do those manually in the admin. In order to confirm that this all worked, I'm going to create a super user, start up my server, and then actually add some students and schools to this. So first thing I want to do is say python manage.py and migrate. Okay, perfect. And then I'll say python. It told me to say make migrations, which makes sense. We'll say make migrations, basic underscore app, hit enter. It created the model school, created the model student, perfect. And then we'll say python manage.py and migrate one more time. And it's applying all those migrations. Looks like it worked out well. Finally, I want to create a super user, python manage.py, create super, whoops, let me make sure I spell that right. Create super user. We'll say Jose, uh, whatever password is fine. Just hello at gmail.com. Password, I'll use test password. And I'll type that in again. Great, so now my super user is ready to go. I've migrated the databases. Let's add in some schools and students to make sure everything's working properly. I'll type in Python, manage.py, run the server, and then bring in my browser. Okay, bringing in that browser, I can still see stuff from the template view. We're gonna change this later on. But what I'm more concerned about is going to that admin page. Perfect, Django administration, let's log in. And then we can see here I have schools and students. So what I will do is I'm gonna add some schools and add some students to those schools. So let's create a school. We'll call this school, whoops, for school, principal, Mr. John, wherever. And we'll say it's based in San Francisco, or let's just say San Fran, because I don't wanna to type too much, and we'll save that. Let me expand this all the way. And let's create one more school. We'll call this new second school, principal, say Mrs. Smith, and its location, uh, we'll say New York. Obviously, it doesn't really matter what values we put in here. So there are our first schools. Let's come back to basic app, and let's add in some students. So I'm going to add a student, and first student, we'll just call them, uh, let's call them Mikey, or Mike, whatever, 10 years old, and I'm going to assign them to a school from this drop-down menu. Mikey goes to that first school, and let's add two students per school. So we'll have John, they'll be 12 years old, also goes to first school, save that. And then let's come back up here, whoops, actually let's stay at students, and we'll uh, put in some more students. We'll say Lauren is 11 years old, and we'll have her go to new second school and then add a student and I'll call Sarah, whatever, nine years old, doesn't really matter, new second school. So I assign two girls name to the second school. That way I make sure that everything's working when I work with stuff on the front end and I assign two boys name to the first school. It really doesn't matter. It should be apparent to you however you do this. So we'll come back home. Everything's ready to go. I'm going to log out. And then let's jump back into the Atom text editor and continue by actually working with the class-based views and then pointing the URLs to them. All right, so as I mentioned in the slides portion of this lecture, it's very common to have a templates folder underneath the application those templates belong to. So we're going to show that paradigm of creating the templates folder that way instead of just having a single template with the base files. So what we're gonna do is we'll keep base.html and index.html under the templates folder. Note that they're not underneath a subdirectory of the basic app. Instead, we'll say that templates that relate to the basic application are going to be underneath their own templates folder. So we will say basic app, new folder, and we'll call it templates. And then it's also common that underneath this templates, you add in another folder that matches the application name. Now there's various ways to do this, and what I would recommend is you actually check out the documentation page 
on different conventions. And there's also a great book called Two Scoops of Django, which has its own conventions for setting up a project and setting up file formats. And there's also something called Cookie Cutter Django that you may also want to Google and check out, which kind of shows some boilerplate uh, Django. Again, this is kind of a thing where it's your own personal preference. So I, want, I don't want to actually give any hard guidelines here on you have to do it this way. It really depends on the scope of your project and how self-contained you want applications to be. So this method, the applications are a little more self-contained because the templates are going to be underneath the applications folder, which is nice if we intend to use this application for another project. But if you're doing a small project, maybe you don't need all of this. So keep that in mind. There's no right or wrong way to do stuff here. Okay, continuing on underneath this basic folder, I'll create three new files. I'll create some basic app base.html that I will extend from. And then I'll also create a new file and I'll create a school detail.html file. And then I'm also going to create a school list file. So new file, school list.html. So those are three HTML files. And what I'm going to do right now is play around these HTML files and make sure everything is set up for those class-based views. And in order to actually do that, we have to create those class-based views. So let's hop back over to views.py. And you can kind of do this in any order you want. Essentially, we have three main tasks left. That's set up the remaining class-based views, set up those HTML template files, and then also set up the urls.py to point the views to those new templates we created. So we have those three things left to do. There's no right order to do them in since they kind of all co-depend on each other. So something we'll just start off with is the actual class-based views themselves. And the first thing you're gonna do is say from django.views.generic is import instead of view or template view, the list view, and then the detail view. And these are gonna be two views that you use all the time. In fact, list view and detail view are pretty much the most common generic views you'll see in other people's Django projects. They're really so useful that people use them all the time. And let's try to make the argument and show the motivation why. I'll create a class, school list view, pass in list view, and then I will connect it to a model. And we just have to say model is equal to and then the actual name of the model. And that means that I actually need to import models. So I will say from dot import models. What I could have also done is say from basic underscore app import models. Dot just means look in the current directory. Dot is a little nicer in case you ever want to change the actual name of stuff here. Okay, so we will say model is equal to models dot school. And we will save that. And believe it or not, that is all you have to do, and you will be provided with a list of every record in this model. That's it. That list view does all the work for you. Okay, so now let's show what a detail view looks like. We'll say class, school detail view, and then pass in a detail view. And we'll also connect it to model is equal to models.school. And then let's provide it with a template underscore name. So you can see how list view and detail view are kind of related to the template view in the fact that they can take the same class object attribute, template underscore name. And this is where we're going to point it to the template. In this case, it goes under basic app slash school underscore detail dot HTML. That was a template we just made underneath the basic app's own templates folder, basic app folder. And that sort of organization makes using this detail view and list view a little easier, which is why you sort of see that more common in the real world. Okay, so we'll leave these like this for now. And what we're later gonna show is how you can use the context object name class attribute. So I'll leave that out for now, but we'll come back to this. We're not finished with this views.py file just quite yet but I will save it for now. Okay, so we still have to work with the templates we made, those various HTML files, and we still have to work with the urls.py file to connect the views to those new templates. This is a good cutting off point, and we'll continue all of this right where we're leaving off here in the next lecture. Thanks, and if you have any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums, and make sure to also check the notes that belong to this lecture.
Welcome back! We're going to continue right where we left off. Previously we had finished setting up these two class-based views and we set up the models as well. We have the list view which is going to list out all the schools that are in the school model and then we also have the school detail view which is going to show all the details of a specific entry in that school model database and that includes things like showing all the students for a particular school. What we need to do is set up the templates and then set up the urls.py file. So it really doesn't matter what order you do this in. You can set up the urls.py file first and then set up the templates or do the templates first and then set up the urls.py. It makes sense either way since they're basically codependent on each other. We'll start off with the templates and we should always start off with the base template. That makes the most sense since we're going to be extending that into the other pages. So I'm right now under the templates folder that's in the same directory level as the project and the application. So there's my project folder, application folder, and then templates folder, base HTML, and index HTML. Let's take care of this. What would be nice to add in here is a navigation bar that can take us to the various pages. So we'll call nav, and we will give this class equal to, and this is one of those kind of quirky bootstrap names. It's navbar space navbar dash default and then we'll say navbar dash static dash top. And then inside of this navbar we have an unordered list and that also takes in a special bootstrap class which again quirky name nav navbar dash nav. Okay so let's have three items in this actual navbar. So we'll have three list elements inside of this unordered list and each of these is actually also going to be an anchor tag since they're going to link to other pages on our page. And what we're going to be doing is using URL template tagging. But before we do that, let's actually give these anchor tags their bootstrap classes. The first one is going to be navbar dash brand. Remember, this is kind of the brand that usually takes you back to the home page. In our case, what we're going to do is once we set up the urls.py file, we will have a URL inside the basic app and we'll give it the list. And let me collapse the directory tree here for a second so we can see everything here. And I'm going to give this the name schools. So in our nav bar, all the way to the left as the brand, there's going to be larger text that says schools. And if someone clicks on that, they should then see a list of all the schools. And that utilizes the list view. Then we're going to have two more links here. And this will just be navbar dash link as the class. And inside of this is going to be another URL template. And this is just going to be to the admin page. In case we ever want to quickly go to the admin page, I can say admin colon index. And let's just make this say admin. So that takes us directly to the admin page. And we'll just have an empty uh, thing right here because later on we'll add a third link. But right now we can just keep it empty. And I'm actually going to do control A or command A, depending on your operating system and then copy all of this. So select it all, copy it, and I'm going to bring it into under basic app, templates, basic app, basic app underscore base. I'm going to paste that all in here because I essentially wanted to have the same navigation bar in the basic app base.html. So I will save that. And now let's come back to our home page. This is index.html under the templates folder that's in the same directory as the project. And I'm going to just get rid of all this and let's put in a jumbotron and say something like home page. Save that. And right now base.html and index.html are done. Let's go to basic app base, school detail and school list and see how we can add something to those templates. So we'll start off with the school list.html and what we're going to do here is say extends and we'll extend from basic underscore app slash basic underscore app underscore base dot html. And that matches the base HTML file for our specific templates application. Or I should say application templates. And we'll start off the block. So we'll call block body underscore block. And then because we're calling that, we also want to make sure we call an end block. And now what we can do is say header one, and we'll call this welcome to a list of 
all the schools. Save that. And then what I will do here is have an ordered list. And inside this ordered list, I'm going to have template tagging with a for loop. I'll say for school in school underscore list. I'll say h2, some have some heading here, a list item, h2 just so it looks a little larger instead of just a paragraph. And then we'll call, look, have this be even like a link. But right now we'll just say school and then grab the name of that school. And let me end that for, so the end for should go here. So I'm going to say end for. And what you're probably wondering right now is where does this term come from, school underscore list? Well, we're familiar with context dictionaries, but you probably don't remember us actually defining school underscore list in the context dictionary of views.py. So if I jump over to views.py, here inside the school list view, we don't see any mention of the variable school underscore list. So again, where does this actually come from, school underscore list? Do we have to define this by ourselves with some sort of call to a context dictionary? And the list view object right here that we inherit from actually is doing the work of creating that context dictionary and returning it for you. In fact, what it does is it takes the model you called, lowercases everything, and then adds underscore list. So for instance, if I'm calling models.school, essentially what it's doing, and this is just going to be in comments, it returns a list with the name school underscore list. So this thing lowercase, and then it adds in underscore list. Now, if you're working by yourself, that may be fine, but usually for larger projects, you have someone working with the front end and another person working on the back end or teams, etc. And you wanna make sure that you're not constantly changing stuff and maybe they're not even aware of list views and things being called as an underscore list. So it might be better if you decide on your own terms what you want this actual object to be called. So what might make sense is for this to be called schools. Well, how do we actually affect views.py to call the context object that gets returned whatever we want? Thankfully, it's really easy. What you end up doing is using a class object attribute. So here, you just say context underscore object underscore name is equal to, and then whatever you want. In this case, we wanted schools. So here you can define your own context object name that's going to return the list of all the schools inside that model school. So if you come back here, then we can just match this up with schools. Okay, and that's probably usually where you're going to be seeing. That way you're fully under control and you never have to worry about matching up to the model name. You know exactly what you're calling and you have more flexibility over it. While we're at it, let's do the same thing for school detail view. So here I will call this context object name equal to school underscore detail. Now you might be wondering, well, if list takes the model name and then adds an underscore list to it as the default context return, what does detail view return? Well, detail view actually just returns the model lowercase, so that's it. So it would just return school lowercase. List views return school underscore list. Okay. So hopefully that made sense. If you have any questions, you can check out the documentation, which actually has a really nice example of this, or you can also just post to the Q&A forums. But the basic idea here is if you're ever confused on what the context was called, you just set it yourself. Context underscore object underscore name equal to whatever you want to call it. All right, so we have our list view, and this returns a list of all the records inside models.school. So coming here, since this is a list, I know I can say for school and schools, and then do something with school.name. Okay, so this is fundamentally different than what we've done before because usually we would have to have said grab something from a context dictionary and call .objects.all. But basically, listing is such a common exercise that the list view is doing it automatically in what they're returning to you. Okay, so that's the basics of using the list view for what we need to do. And that's all we're going to do for now with the school list HTML. Now let's come over here to the actual school detail.html. And what we will do is call extends from, and then quotes here we'll pass in basic underscore app slash basic underscore app underscore base dot html. Oops, and then let's start off our block. So we'll call block 
it's the body block we're calling, and then let's call end block. And in here what we're going to do is play around with the school details. So we'll have a header one that says, in fact, let's put this all in a Jumbotron. Uh, you probably noticed throughout the course that I'm kind of a big fan of the way the Jumbotron looks. Uh, probably too much of a big fan. Um, probably don't want to use Jumbotrons as often as I do, but for teaching, they make things really clear because you get this nice little center Jumbotron. But now, inside this heading one, we'll say, welcome to the school detail page. And here's where we're going to return details about the school. So we'll create heading two and say school details. And in paragraphs, what we're going to do is this. We'll have a template tag here. And remember the context dictionary we returned was called school underscore detail. That's what we defined over here in views.py. I called school underscore detail, which means that's what this is. It's the actual school itself. We don't need to say objects or anything. So what I'm going to do is call the name of the school and we'll call this name. And then let's add in a couple more things. Remember the schools also have principles to them. So we'll say principal and inject school underscore detail dot principal. Hopefully I'm spelling everything correctly. If not, we'll have to do a little debugging. Then another paragraph here and I'm going to call location and we'll call school detail dot location. Make sure that matches the whatever you call the fields in your models.py file. And then what we're going to do is actually we'll just leave it like that for now and we'll come back to this and add some more detail to it later. But here we can see we have those actual details. Now let's go to the urls.py file and set a few things up. Okay, we have the basics set up, so let's match over to our urls.py file and actually make sure everything's working correctly. So underneath our project, we have the project urls.py file. So we'll scroll all the way down. We see URL patterns. We see that original views.index view that we created. We'll keep that for the home page. And what we're going to do is call the URL function, regular expression, caret, and then what we will say is basic underscore app slash, and then we're going to use the include function, which means we actually need to import it. So we'll say include here. Let's get a little space there, save that. And then I'm going to say include basic underscore app dot URLs. And we can provide a namespace for this if we ever need to refer to it later. And we can just call it basic underscore app. So we shall save that. And now what this is going to do is allow us to reach over to the basic apps urls.py file, which we actually haven't created yet. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm right clicking on my basic app top directory, saying new file and calling urls.py, just as we've done in the past. And here now our basic application is going to have its own urls.py file. And what we need to do is say from django.clnf.urls import url. And then I will say from basic, uh, whoops, not form, from basic underscore app, import those views. And remember, I'm going to use app name is equal to basic underscore app. And if you don't remember why I'm doing that, it's because in the templates themselves, especially the nav bar, if I go over to the base nav bar, remember when I'm doing things like this, basic app list, and then admin comma index, etc. that sort of notation can only be done if I remember to set this app name. So now that that's ready to go, we'll say URL patterns is equal to a list. And let's start with just one link here, regular expression. And we'll just show the list of you for now. We won't worry about the details page. And let's say comma views dot school list view. And remember, we have to say as view because it's a class based view and we can give it the name list. So what's the reason for giving it the name? That's for the URL template tag. So here I have the basic app name list. So basic app colon list, that comes back to the base.html file for this, basic app colon list. Hopefully by now you're beginning to see those connections and how everything kind of works together. Let's actually test if this all worked by running the server. I'm going to say Python, whoops, let me actually CD first into 
the advanced section and then CD into our project. Now I'm going to say Python manage.py and then run the server. See if we get any errors. Looks like it's thinking about it. And the error we get is basic app.views has no attribute index view. So I may have accidentally deleted that. Let's come back to our views.py file and make sure I didn't delete it. Whoops, looks like I did. No problem. Luckily with template view, it's easy to fix. We'll say class index view, and I'm just going to inherit the template view, and I'll set template name equal to index.html. And you can review back to the template view lecture if you want more information about this, but you can see here that basically took care of the problem. So I accidentally deleted this, and I didn't have to. So now I'm going to copy this and put it in my browser. Let's see if everything worked. Okay, here I am at my browser. It looks like the home page is working. We fixed the index view, good news. Now let's click on schools and then bingo. Welcome to a list of all the schools. One first school, new second school. Perfect. So we can see here that our list view is working correctly. And again, just as a quick reminder of what's actually happening here. Usually when we wanted to list through everything in a model, we would have to have called that model, dot objects, dot all, etc. What list view does for us is it puts that all in in this nice convenient context object name called schools. So then I can just say for blank and schools, then list stuff off of that. So again, listing stuff in your model, every entry is so common that that's already all built in for you in these three lines of code here. You connect the model and you don't even have to say context object name. That's only the option if you want to have your own context. Okay. Now, let's check out the admin page before we actually talk about the detail view. So I'm going to log back into this and then Jose test password. Perfect. And inside our administration page, if we look at basic app, we have the schools and students. And if I click on students, notice that we never actually set a primary key when we were developing that model. We set a foreign key that matched to the school, but we didn't actually set a primary key. And for this particular application, that kind of actually makes sense. We wouldn't want to set the name of the student as a primary key because students may share names. Sarah may be a common name between two girls, and we wouldn't want the model getting confused that we have matching primary keys there. So instead, what we end up doing is not defining one. And if you don't define a primary key, what Django does in the background for you is it sets an ID, which is just a serial number marker. So the first entry you put in is one, the second entry is two, second entry is three. And it just has that unique identifier, that primary key as a single number, which means we can call dot ID off of it, either for a student or for school, since actually for neither of them, we set up a primary key. So let's log out and I'm going to come back to the Atom text editor, do control C here. And again, just to reiterate, if I come to models.py, none of these fields did I ever indicate that it was a primary field. The only thing I indicated was that the student had a foreign key in school. But since none of them were actually primary keys or primary fields, then what Django did in the background was set an ID for every entry, which is just a numerical indicator. And we can use that to actually link for a couple of things. So this is where we're going to really show off how convenient list views and details views can be. If I come back to school list, what would be nice if that if I click on the school, then it takes me to the school's particular detail page. And so what we need to do is come to school list and inside of this H2 LI, I'm going to pass in an anchor tag. And this anchor tag is going to have the school name as its text. So it's going to say for school in schools, it's going to list all the schools. So we've already seen that page, but we're actually going to give it href. And what this href is going to be is school.id, which is essentially just a number for that school. So keep that in mind. We're going to use this later with the urls.py with regular expressions in a way that we haven't actually seen before yet. But here we have the school name. That makes sense to us. That's just the name of the school, but it's linking to essentially a number. And we're going to use that in just a second in the urls.py file. But before we do that, we also want to make sure that our details html file is ready so school underscore detail that html here i have school details dot principal dot location that's looking good as well what i'm going to say is also list off all the students that this particular school has so we'll create heading three here and we'll say students 
And then the next thing to do once I have students is actually cycle through the students. So if I want to cycle through something, I need to use a for loop. I will say for student, and you can use whatever variable you want. Student is fine for us. And then we'll say in school underscore detail. Remember school underscore detail is that context we're returning from views.py. And I will call dot students dot all. And then I'm going to just create a paragraph element with the student name and we'll say so that like Mary, Sam, who is we'll call student.age years old. So we should see something that says Mary who is 11 years old, etc. And then whenever you have a for loop, you need to end it. And we'll say end for now, something you may be wondering is where the heck does dot students come from? We know where school underscore detail comes from. That comes from views where we just return school underscore detail. But if we come to dot students dot all, how do we actually get to that? Well, if you go back to models dot pi, remember that we added this related name and that relates the actual school to the students. So we pass it in with a foreign key and we pass in the related name. So I can call back in my school detail page, the actual context of the school dot students dot all, and it's going to grab anything of that matching foreign key. In our case, all the students who had that related name students. That sort of notation can be confusing at first, but again, it's really just a related name that's connecting this foreign key with school so that school can be linked to all of the students that belong to that school. So you just call that related name students and then say dot all to grab all of them over here in this in school detail dot students dot all. All right, so we have our school list and what we need to take care of in the urls.py file is actually working with this school dot id. And that's where regular expressions are going to help us a lot. I'm going to come over here to the applications urls.py file and inside of this what I'm going to do is whoops this is the projects urls.py file. I want my applications. Perfect. Okay. So inside of this what I'm going to do is the following. And this is going to seem almost a little alien if you would feel uncomfortable with regular expressions, but I'm going to try to explain to the best of my ability what's actually happening here. So we'll say caret, and then in parentheses, I'm going to pass in question mark, capital P, and then the less than and greater sign, and then inside of that, we'll pass PK, square brackets, dash, backslash, w and then we'll say plus and that all goes inside the parentheses and then we'll say forward slash dollar sign and then we'll say views dot school detail view and then pass that in as underscore view so we hadn't actually been looking at that detail page yet now we're going to link it and then we'll say name is equal to detail and we'll save that Okay, so what is actually happening here? Well, essentially what we're doing is when someone comes to that school list page, when someone actually clicks on this school's name in that list view, the href is just going to essentially return a single number, the actual number that corresponds as a primary key, or in other words, a PK, primary key. Then if we go to our urls.py file, inside of our application, that's this guy, the primary key that we're actually grabbing. And what we're going to be able to do is link to that school's particular detail view. Now back here under URL patterns, basically what we're saying with this regular expression is grab the basic app extension of the domain name slash, and then whatever this number happens to be for the primary key and take that in as the school details view. And let me make sure that I have a comma here separating these two guys. Looks like I need to add one in. So we'll have a comma there save that and now we have the school list view and we should also have the detail view for that particular school so i will save that and if again if this regular expression is really confusing don't worry it's usually something that you kind of reference the documentation for i would never expect someone to have this memorized right off the bat unless they work with regular expressions all the time but as you get more and more used to particular patterns in your code and web design there are certain regular expressions that you're going to find yourself kind of memorizing for instance we probably already memorized uh, the basic home page, which is just that caret dollar sign. Okay, so let's actually run this. We'll say python manage.py run server 
hit enter, and let me bring up the browser. Okay, so here we are at the home page. Looks like that's working. Let's come over to schools, and now we see that all the schools are actually links. So we can click on the first school, and it says, welcome to the school detail page. It's kind of large since I'm zoomed in here a little bit, and it's a jumbotron. But here we see the school details, and we've looped through all the students in that school. Said Mikey, who was 10 years old, John, who was 12 years old. Perfect. We can come back to schools, try it with new second school, and same thing. Here we see the second school details, Mrs. Smith, New York, and we see Lauren and Sarah. So remember, back when we were setting up the database, it was female students for the new second school. So it looks like everything's matching up perfectly. And those are the basics of how you can use a list view and a detail view. So jumping back to views.py, kind of the whole point of this is that you can quickly use list view and detail view instead of having to play around with those model.objects.all, etc. We saw that we had to do a little bit of that with the detail view, but basically none of that with the list view. And you can always specify the context object name that you want to return. All right. Hope you found this useful, and I will see you at the next lecture where we begin talking about CRUD applications. Hello everyone, and welcome to this final lecture where we're going to be discussing CRUD. Now you may have heard of this term, CRUD, before in web development, but what does it actually mean? Contrary to what you might think it means, it really stands for Create, Retrieve, Update, and Delete. And this process of creating, retrieving, updating, and deleting is inherent to almost every website. Pretty much any website with users has the ability for a user or an administrator to create content, retrieve prior content, update that content, or delete that content. Now we pretty much already know how to retrieve things by using the connection between the URLs, the models, and the views.py file. What we're going to be learning about here is more on creating, updating, and deleting information from our web application. Whenever you work with models and databases, you will need to perform those four basic actions. And luckily, Django has class-based views to simplify this entire process for you. We'll start off by exploring how to use the create view class. Now, as a quick note, while we are using this create view class in the programming section of this lecture, we will purposefully induce a few errors to clarify where certain variable names are coming from. So I'm not making mistakes as I'm coding along, I will actually be inducing those errors on purpose. And I'll remind you of that as we continue programming. Once we've worked through the create view class, working with the update view and delete view classes will be very straightforward. Another quick note, there's going to be a lot of interaction between your urls.py, views.py, and models.py file, as well as all your template files. If you ever get stuck on an error, I want you to triple check that your code has matching the notes exactly or is matching what I've shown you here in the video lecture. The nature of the interaction between all the files is going to make it almost impossible for me to give you good help on this topic in the Q&A forums. So if you ever get stuck on anything and you're really stuck, make sure that you're actually following along with the video exactly or just go ahead and download the associated files for this lecture. All right, let's get started and hop over to the Atom text editor. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor, and over on the right, I also have a browser open to the page that we've been working with throughout this entire section of the course. I have the home page, and we learned how to connect templates and also inject content into this home page. I can click on schools, see a list of all the schools, select first school, and then come to the school detail page. And then I can always click on admin to go to the admin page as well. Let's go back to schools, and we'll see a list of schools here. The first thing I want to do is show you how we could possibly create a new school using create view. In order to do that, let's hop over to our views.py file under basic app. And I'm going to create a new class that, as you may have guessed, is going to be called school create view. So I will collapse this directory for a second. And before we actually get started with this, let's import the views we're going to be using. Right now we're importing view, template view, list view. And what I can do to put these in multiple lines is have some parentheses here and anything wrapped inside these parentheses can then go on multiple lines. So I'm importing view, template view, list view, detail view. We're already familiar with those. And then I'm also going to be importing create view, update view, and then delete view. And basically what these views are going to do and help us out with is create view will help us create new additions to our models. 
update is going to take an existing entry in your model and allow you to update it. And then delete view will allow you to take something that exists there and delete it. So let's start off with create view, which is going to allow us to essentially create a new school easily. I will scroll down over here and underneath school detail view, I will say something like class school create view and then we'll just pass in create view we'll inherit from that and then what I'm going to do under the create view is I will say model is equal to models dot school and then I will save that and whenever we create a view we want to make sure that it's linked to some sort of URL so I'll bring back my directory tree and come over to the urls.py file of my actual application and I'm going to add another line there for another URL. So let's actually edit this a little bit. Right now I have this sort of regular expression and I'm going to simplify this. Instead of having this in brackets here, let's just make this say digit plus. And basically what this is doing is it's taking the primary key of the school as the display. And what I want to do is create a new URL link here. And this will take in as a regular expression, just create forward slash dollar sign. So what this says is if someone goes to the domain page slash basic app slash create, it's going to allow us to create a new school. And here we'll say views dot school create view dot as view. Remember we have to do that for class based views and we'll go ahead and give it a name and the name we're going to give it is just create so we can reference it later and since I added a new item to this list I want to make sure that they're separated by commas okay so just to expand this a little bit so we can see this in a tiny bit more detail here I've just added this URL create views.school create as view name is create we're going to save that and then what we're going to do is check it out over here and we will get some errors but I'm going to walk you through them so we can get a better understanding of why we're getting these errors. So I will come back to schools, refresh, and then I'll click on first school. It's the welcome to school detail page. All right, so far so good. I'll come back up here to where it says basic app and I'm going to try to go to create. I'll hit enter and note what happens here. It says improperly configured at basic app create using model form mixin base class of school create view without the fields attribute is prohibited. So that's the error I want you to learn how to read in case you ever encounter it. So basically what this is saying is, hey, you wanna create a view, but you didn't specify what fields are prohibited and what fields are allowed. Well, that's easy enough to fix. We'll come back to views.py and over here under create, just like we did back when we were working with models, we're going to define the fields that we will allow a user to create. So the school had three main fields, the name, the principal, and location. And this almost acts like a security measure. Maybe you don't want someone to edit the location of a school or the name of a school, etc. We'll just pass in all the fields for now. Principal and then location. And I'm going to save this. And as I refresh this page, I should see probably another error. And there it is. So template does not exist. Well, that makes sense. I never actually created a template for this school creation page. But what's interesting here is it tells you that it's looking for basic app school form. And basically what that means is that Django, that create view, is automatically creating a default HTML template that it's expecting. And it's, it's expecting it to be in the format of all lowercase the model name in our case at school underscore and then form so let's add that in and i would always suggest that you use the defaults there so underneath templates basic app i will create a new file and i will call it what it was looking for school underscore form.html and it makes sense that we need some sort of form for the editor or user to come in and create a new school and let's show you how we can create this school form page. First things first though, I want to say extends from the basic app slash and then the basic app base, which was 
basic app underscore base.html. Okay, so that's going to allow me to extend that template and then let's have in our body block. So we'll call block body underscore block. And since I have a block, I will say and block as well. All right, now let's actually put something here and this is what the user is going to see when they actually try to create a new school. And I'm going to essentially think ahead and know that I'm also going to add an update view later on. So keep that in mind as I'm working here. Usually you wouldn't just know this all off the top of your head. And in this header or heading one, I'm going to use some logic. I'll have an if statement in my template tagging and I will say if not form.instance.pk and we'll explain what that means in a little bit. I will say create school. And then since I know I'm also going to add an update view later on, meaning update a school that already exists, I will say else update school. And then since I have an if, I always need to and if. So what do these lines actually mean? Well, basically what I'm saying is the following. I'm going to extend from basic app, have the body block, and the heading of this form page, that create page, is going to check if the instance of the primary key exists or not. If it does not exist, that means this is a new school and we're going to create the school. Otherwise, we're updating a school that currently exists. And this will make more sense as we actually develop the update view. But hopefully you get the basic idea that I'm checking first, hey, does the primary of that key of that school exist? Well, in that case, if it doesn't exist, I'm creating a school. Else, if it already does exist, then I'm updating the school. And then finally, to actually update school, we need to take in with a form some information. And we actually just need to specify the method as post. We don't need to have a class or action here. You could have a class with this bootstrap stuff we've been learning about, but we'll keep it simple for now. As always, if any form, we need to have our CSRF token. CSRF token, and this should be underscore token. And then we're going to inject our form, as we've seen earlier, uh, whoops, as P. And then finally, we'll say input the type is going to be a submit button and let's give it a class just so it looks a little nicer. Since we are working with bootstrap, we'll say it's a BTN, BTN dash primary. Always nice to flex those bootstrap muscles and let's give it a value of submit. We'll save that and hopefully that worked out this error. Remember that was the school form that HTML and it's really important that you have the ability to read these sort of errors. Throughout a lot of the course, we've been kind of avoiding errors to begin with, but now I really want you to get familiar and be able to read, oh, template does not exist. Well, that means I need to check out what template it's expecting. All right, let's refresh this. And perfect, we see create a school. Now let's try to actually create a school. We'll give it the name of the school, my brand new school. The principal will be, I don't know, someone named Larry. And the location will say it's in, uh, I don't know, Panama. We'll say submit and boom, we have another problem. It says improperly configured at basic app underscore app create. And it says it has no URL to redirect to. Either provide a URL or, and this is what we're going to be doing, define a get underscore absolute underscore URL method on the model. So let's follow those directions and actually do it. Okay, so I'm going to come over to the models and I'm going to look for school and it told me that I should define a get absolute URL method for this model. So let's follow those instructions. I'll say def get absolute underscore URL and we'll pass in self. And then what we're going to do is basically reverse and tell it what primary key we want this school to be created with. So what we need to do is actually import reverse from URL resolvers, which we have seen before. Say from django.core.url 
resolvers, import, whoops, reverse. And that means I can use it down here, where I will just return reverse. And what I'm going to do here is call basic underscore app, the detail view, not the detail view as in the importing, but the actual detail in the views.py file. And then we need to add some keyword arguments as a parameter. And the keyword argument I'm going to pass here is PK for primary key. And the value for that is just self.pk. So let's save that. And again, learning how to kind of read and roll the punches on some of these error codes. So it says get absolute URL method. We did that already. Let's refresh this. It may ask us to continue. That's fine. It says, welcome to the school detail page. School details, my brand new school, Larry in Panama. So what was actually going on here? Basically what happened is after we created that view, we never told Django where it should go to. We never said, oh, go do something after you created the view, which is why Django was requesting for a get absolute URL. And basically what we said is, okay, go back and reverse and figure out that you should go to the detail page or whatever the primary key is of the school you just made. In our case, this is basic app four. Your number may be different, however. And that's the very basics of having a create view. So if I go back to the list of schools, I can see I have my brand new school and my brand new school. So the reason it's inserted twice here is because we basically did it twice while we were kind of fixing some of those errors. But don't worry, we'll fix that when we learn how to delete views. But first, let's learn how to work with update view. And a lot of the work is actually has already been done for us since we did a lot of stuff while we were doing the create view. So school update view should actually be quite simple as well. Let's come over to views.py and I will create a new class called school update view. And I would recommend that you name your classes basically the way I'm doing it with the model name and then create view or update view or detail view, etc. And then I'm going to inherit from update view. And this one's quite simple. Again, we're going to specify what fields we want to be updated. Now, this is where maybe you can think about, okay, who's going to be updating this? What kind of user permissions will they have? And also what makes sense for updating a school? Does it make sense to update a school's principal? Well, yeah, that makes sense. Principals can change. Does it make sense to update a school's name? Uh, maybe. What about the location of a school? Well, probably not. Schools usually don't move around that much. So let's just say you can only update the name and the principal of a school. Obviously, your own situations are going to be unique, and you'll have to make that call. And what we're going to do here is once we have this, we'll just connect it to the model. We'll say model is equal to models dot, and in our case, it's the school model. We'll save this, and then what we're going to do is come back to urls.py and actually set up a URL for our updating. Inside this urls.py file for our application, what I'm going to do is copy this detail view, paste it again, and this is basically the same view I want, except I want to clarify some sort of update extension. So basically, if I go to basic underscore app slash update slash and then the number of the primary key of the school, it will let me update that school. So I need to change this from detail view to update view as view. And then I will change the name to detail to update. And then let me save that. And the next thing we have to do is actually edit the HTML file or the template file that relates to the school detail page. So let's hop over to that. And right now, this is our detail page. And it just says for the information of the school, list of students, etc. And what we will do is outside of this, in fact, let's put it outside this div, but before the end block, I'll create a new div inside its own container. And it'll just be a paragraph with an anchor tag inside of it. And this will be a URL template. And this will be a URL template that takes you to the basic underscore app with the name update. And we'll pass in an argument, PK, 
school underscore detail dot pk. And let's actually give this a class so it looks a little nicer. We'll say this is class of, for bootstrap, we can say btn. We'll give it warning, you can give it success, whatever you want, but maybe a warning makes sense if you're gonna update something. It's kind of a yellow hue by uh, original nature. And then we actually want to have some sort of text here that tells you you're gonna update this. All right, let's save this and we'll refresh this page and see what happens. So now if I scroll down a little bit, I see this update button. And we can always uh, zoom out so it's a little more clear. So now on the detail page, I can see this update button. You may have to scroll down depending on how zoomed in you are. And if I click on it, I get the form and the option to update the school and only the fields that I specified, the name and principal. So let's try to change the name of the school. Actually, let's just change the principal to something really obvious like Mr. I don't know, obvious. That should be a really obvious change. We'll submit it, and then it takes us back to that school's detail page. That's what we were working with when we said here on the href URL, basic app update, and then PK school detail PK, that allows us to link whatever school we're actually updating with. So welcome to the school page. I can see now first school has the principal Mr. Obvious. And if I come back to schools, click on first school, I can see that that change has been permanently done. Great. So now we learned how to create views and how to update views. The last thing we need to do is figure out how we can delete views. So let's go back to our actual editor. I'll bring back my directory tree. And what I'm going to do is come over here to the views.py and we'll create our last and final view, which is the school delete view. We'll have delete view here. And this one's going to be slightly different from everything we've done so far, as far as updating and creating views, but it's actually not so bad. First thing you have to do is say model is equal to models.school. Connect the models, that makes sense, as far as what we're going to delete. And then the next thing I have to add in is a success URL variable, or attribute, I should say, because this is a class. So we'll create an attribute called success underscore URL. And what we're going to do is use the reverse underscore lazy function. So I need to go up and import that. And I'll explain what it is right after I import it. We'll say from Django.core dot URL resolvers. And it's actually from the same place where you imported reverse from. So we can import reverse or reverse underscore lazy. And if you're familiar with programming, you may have heard of the term lazily evaluated. And what we're going to do is all the way down here, and it's actually telling us we need to still finish that off, where it says success URL, we will call reverse underscore lazy and pass in that we wanna to go to the basic app and the list view. So what this success URL means is, all right, once you've successfully deleted a school, I want you to go back to the list page of the basic app and show all the schools. And theoretically, once you're done deleting it, that school should no longer be on that list. The reason we use reverse lazy is that we don't want this evaluated completely when running our .py file. We only want it to wait until it's actually called as a success. And as with all the other views we've been working with, we need to go ahead and add a urls.py that actually matches with this particular view. So we'll come back here to urls.py and let me collapse this to see a little more room. And again, this is going to look really similar to update. Instead of updating something though, we're going to be deleting it. So we'll hit enter and I'm going to change this name from update to delete. I'll change this update to delete as well. And then here where it says update, we'll change that to delete. So I should be able to go to basic app slash delete and then any primary key and start getting some options for deleting stuff. But in order to do that, I should have some sort of HTML file. So we'll go ahead and go with the default HTML file that's expected and we'll add it in right now. We don't need to see those errors anymore. And what we do is we say school underscore confirm underscore delete.html. And this is going to be the page that's actually shown 
when someone tries to manually delete something from the database. We'll say extends and we're going to go from the basic app slash basic app underscore base.html file that I have here. And then let's start our block. We'll have our body block. And with any block, we need to end the block. And what we're going to have here is basically just says h1. And we'll say delete. And it will automatically pass in a context object called school or whatever the lowercase version of your model is. Remember we previously covered how to create your own context object names. If you come back here to views and scroll up a little bit, we talked about it here, context object name. The basic one for detail that I encourage you to just use the default is the lowercase version of your model. So we'll use that. We expect school to be here and what we're going to call off of it is the name and say question mark. So what this is going to show is a heading that says, hey, delete that school's name question mark and then we'll just have a simple form this simple form is just going to say method is post with any form we always need a csrf token and it's going to have an input the input will just be submit and now we can kind of play with the classes of bootstrap and I've been waiting to use this a long time, but we can finally use the danger button. We don't need to actually give this a name, but we should give it a value. That way it says something. We'll just have it say delete. And below this, if you don't want to delete, we should have some sort of link that goes back to cancel, or at least some sort of text. You can have this be a button, another form, whatever you want. I'm just going to have it be an anchor tag with the word cancel inside of it. And for the href, we'll have it take us back to that school's detail page. So we'll have a URL template here that goes to basic app or whatever the name of your application is, detail in that URL, and then we'll say pk is equal to school dot primary key. So again, we're grabbing the primary key off that school context object that's returned just the same way we grabbed its name. Because remember that detail URL, if we go back to urls.py, over here under the term detail, we're expecting some sort of primary key to be inserted, which is why we've been having to pass it in as an argument in these HTML template files. Okay, so let's save this and we'll refresh our schools page. And let's go ahead and try to delete school number four because I have a duplicate there. So up here in the URL, I will say basic app, delete, forward slash four, hit enter, and it says delete my brand new school. And we can see here, we can click cancel, which is going to take us back to that detail page of that particular school, or I can hit delete. So let's try it. We'll hit delete, and there you go. That school has now been deleted. Let's try it one more time, make sure it's actually working. Try it on that other brand new school. And whoops, I actually need to enter this manually. Later on, you can add links if you want. Obviously, you should be very careful adding delete links all over the place. But here I am at delete slash three, delete my brand new school, and we'll hit delete. Okay, perfect, it's all working. Later on, we'll also learn how to use slugs instead of just primary keys, where slugs are essentially the name of objects, lowercase, with dashes in between any spaces. And if you're familiar with web development at all, you've probably heard that term before. Okay, I hope you enjoyed learning about updating, creating, and deleting views. And I hope that this makes your life a lot easier. As you find yourself programming with larger projects in Django, you're going to be using those views all the time. And that's basically the whole point of Django, to make your life a little easier as you try to focus on what's really important, developing your own website. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture.